long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, console reader Scott Daly, and joining me, as always, God. How's Hello, it going? my child. <laughs> I got a question for you. Go. Why are you so cruel? Um, I'm. Uh, it's, it's complicated, man. It's complicated. <laughs> two, two, J. Who do you think you are? Me is the actual answer. Yeah, yeah. It's the safe answer. You don't have to answer the question if you just attack the person asking it. Smart. <laughs> this week, our eleven-part coverage of Stephen King's Desperation continues as we finish the book. We're going to be covering chapters four of part through all the way to the end of the novel. Our final confrontation with Tack occurs as both David and Johnny do their duty to God. As it turns out, God is indeed cruel, but perhaps, Matt, perhaps that's not all he is. What did you think of this week's reading? Um, This was a a fairly satisfying conclusion in some ways. You know, I I really love this book overall, uh, and and that's the prelude of a compliment sandwich where I say (laughs) – I, I found certain elements of the conclusion to be less than satisfying, but you know, I think sometimes uh, Mr. King intends that. You know, he, he doesn't always want to leave you with just a, a, a feeling of satisfaction where you can just put the book down and and smack your lips at, at what a you know how smooth that went down. I think this is one book where he kind of wants you to to be left with a feeling of dissatisfaction. So, um, I mean, I I, I didn't I, I definitely enjoyed it. I, I was just like, huh. We, we we did that, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of satisfying stuff in there. We're going to have a great conversation. No, this is great because I, I do think this is kind of, in my opinion, um, kind of what 90s King is all about for me, where where I, I tend to really enjoy the things. I, I felt similarly about Insomnia when we covered that, where I really enjoyed the book overall. Um, but yeah, there's some parts where I'm just like, eh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and and I, I felt the same way about this book where I, I did enjoy my time with it. I did enjoy talking with you about this book over the last eight weeks. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some stuff here, uh, that I think ties into some of the, I'll call them complaints, but quibbles, I guess, that I had earlier in the, the novel. Um, and, and then there's some, some, yeah, some, some designed dissatisfaction as well, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get into it. Yeah, we will. Let's do it. Let's just go ahead. Let's just go ahead and get into it. Um, so we begin this week, chapter four of part four, um, and we're back with with our friend Johnny. Uh, we pick up with him right where we left him, Matt, which is standing in the Quonset hut being attacked by a wolf. Um, I, I, I love this this moment of <laughs> Johnny being like, wait, David said that Tack was going to let us go, wanted us to go. Why is... Why is he killing me with this wolf? And then it's like, well, obviously it's because he's evil. And yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> it's because he does whatever the hell he wants to do, man. Uh huh. He he wanted you to be gone. He didn't necessarily care whether that was by wolf or by vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, it's entirely possible that Tack just kind of forgot because at this point, Tack is slipping so bad that it's plausible yeah. that he intended on letting Johnny get away and then sort of couldn't help himself from sticking the wolf on him just tax uh uh sort of myopia 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 yes is uh is getting increasingly bad yeah no i think that's true like as we talked about last week like the deliciousness of the the villain kind of uh deteriorating both physically in this case and also uh mentally their their capacity for evil is just kind of overwhelming them um, to the point where they're just being ineffectual around around everything yep um, I, I love this moment. Johnny says, God help me, but, but here's nothing. And then we get this wonderful passage. God was just something you said, a word you used when you could see the shit once more getting ready to obey the law of gravity and fall into the fan. No God, no God. He wasn't a suburban kid from Ohio, still three years away from his first encounter with a razor. Prayer was just a manifestation of what psychologists called magical thinking. And there was no God. If there was, why would he come see about me anyhow? Why would he come see about me after I left the others back in that truck? I, I, I love this, right? Because this is, you know, perfect for Johnny, right? Where he has this long paragraph where he's like, there's no God. God doesn't exist. I don't believe in any of this bullshit. And then it's the, the last bit of this is the true Johnny, the reveal of uh, 
and even if there was, I'm a piece of shit. Why would anyone ever care about me or help me out? Or like, you know, it's just perfect, perfect Johnny's whole whole mental like just how he works it's just how he processes everything yeah right i mean in in that sense he's one of those classic characters who um is is always committing double think where he's 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 perpetually in contradiction with himself um and um you know full of shit in in the in (laughs) in the way that my favorite king characters all are yeah and i mean like Especially since, like, I don't know, like, everyone struggles with their faith, right? Every, every person that has faith struggles with that faith. But, like, very few people experience the things that Johnny has experienced over the course of this book. Like, I, I feel like my struggle with my faith would be all but gone at this point if mm-hmm. I just witnessed this crazy absolute miracle stuff. You know, I say that, but then, like, it, it, it's, it's, it's one thing to be reading about it in a book where you know for a fact that all this stuff is really happening. It's another to be experiencing, right? Like, like I, I keep going back to the Salem's Lot conversation we had years and years ago now of, like, how long would it take you to recognize that, oh, no, there are actually vampires in this town? And I yeah. think it's the same thing. Like, how, how many of these miracles would you have to witness before you're going, okay, no, these are actual miracles. There is actually something divine going on here. I don't know. It's, it's very easy to armchair quarterback this whole thing and be like you should have obviously figured it out by now but who knows how i would react in a situation or how anyone would and i think that's the crux of of why this is an important passage to talk about actually because you know i lovingly say that he's full of shit which is a phrase i've used to describe many (laughs) king characters but like what 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 this really is is it's the human heart in conflict with itself and and it's not really about the idea of just this sort of pat um dismissal of the idea of god it's it's more about his lack of belief that god could ever care about him yeah and uh or, or that he would be a worthy you know servant of god you could say or or the, or, or i think more maybe more broadly that, that there could be anything good or redeemable or, or lovable about him um, right and and he's just he's not open to that idea. And so the idea that God might be present and willing to help him is just not something he's particularly open to, but he's, he's sort of, he sort of is at the same time, right? That's where the conflict comes from. And and mm-hmm. he's, he's just on the edge of being open to it. And this whole experience has pushed him uh, just close enough that he's finally capable of actually reaching out for help for the first time, really. Yeah, definitely. One thing I, I kind of want to try to do this week, um, and maybe we should have been trying to do it from the beginning but now that we've seen the full scope of the book i really want to try is like removing the word god from the equation a little bit here like obviously we're talking very specifically in this book about god capital g god um but i think a lot of a lot of what we're doing here could be you know seen as 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 metaphor and, and parable for talking about just life in general. Like I think, you know, you, you take the phrase God is cruel and you can just sub in the word life. Life is cruel. Like l- life is hard. Life is awful. Um, but life is also wonderful and, and love and, and all the, like, you know, and so I, I kind of want us to, to maybe take a step back and look at God and tack as, as, as less, you know, the, the deities and the, the gods and the, these, these words that have such loaded meaning for everyone and look at them as more concepts of, of, and ideas. Um, and, and I think, I think that benefits the book a little bit here because I, obviously this is a book that is very much about a, a, a very Christian God, um, and a very, you know, very biblical event, but I think it, it can speak large, like, more more broadly to the experience that that people have in life yeah i think you're right um all right so so of course of course there is a god um of course um and the the god uh as johnny turns to run from the wolf he finds himself doing the opposite of that actually and I, i love this this passage here there was no sense of being possessed but a clear and unmistakable feeling of being no longer alone His terror fell away. His first powerful instinct to turn and run also fell away. He took a step forward instead. I love, I love that. Like to, to make this distinct and different from what it is like to be taken over by tack, right? Like this is not possession. This is not commandment. This is not, this is just, Hey, you're not alone anymore. I've got you. And 
because of that, here's this thing that you didn't think you could do. This thing that was inside of you. We know this version of Johnny exists inside of him. We've seen it before. Um, suddenly that version of you is is kind of ignited and and acts here. Yeah. Like you could read this and say, you know, God magically takes his terror and, and his willing his eagerness to flee away. But I don't really feel like that's the way we're operating. I feel like it's just like there, there is now a, a sense that he's not alone. There's a, an, a, you know, definite, unmistakable, clear feeling that he's not alone. And, and just that by itself, that sort of reassurance is enough that he no longer feels afraid and can take the, the right action. Um, and, you know, yeah. it, it's that's that's what I always enjoy fairly consistently with with kings like god intervening in things moments is like it's it's either something as utterly blatant as like a like an obvious miracle or it's something where where you're just like that might have just been a coincidence um (laughs) and and this feels like the latter but you know from within johnny's point of view um he kind of knows it's not even though he later tries to deny it in like five minutes (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i i I love that and i think I think the 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 order of these sentences kind of in, in to me indicate exactly what we're talking about here right like the fact that the first thing it says is a clear unmistakable feeling of being no longer alone like imagine the sentence if if we learn that his terror fell away first and then he feels this clear unmistakable feeling of being no longer alone that to me says god took his terror away like that 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 would be that what that indicates but like the terror falling away is a reaction to this feeling of not being alone. Um, and that is like, I, I think that is one of the, like the core fear, fears of a lot of people, right? Is that you're going through these trials and tribulations of your life and you're alone, that you, there's no one, there's no one there for you. There's no one looking out for you. Um, you know, either, either due to your own actions that you've driven people away or just, just some of the cruelty of people. Sometimes um, you have to suffer through the trials and tribulations of life by yourself. And with the, in this simple moment, it's like, no, no, no. I'm here. It's going to be okay. And, and pretty soon after this, David will be here as well. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So of course, Johnny just like fucking beans the wolf right square on the head with the hammer, the best, most perfect throw ever. We are like led to believe, you know, we talked about, you know, the ways in which God is intervening and he's not literally taking Johnny's terror away. It does seem though, Matt, that God is literally directing the course of the hammer, right? Like there is this recurring beat of, him, him, like the, Johnny and his his experience in baseball as a kid, feeling that he threw the thing high that it it should not have hit um, as perfectly as it did. So I mean, we've talked about the ways in which you know God, Gan, the White, uh, in the course of King, when when this entity directly intervenes and when it does not, right? Um, and it does seem like this is a moment here where it does kind of just just kind of you know push down on the hammer a little bit as it flew through the air could be that or it could just be that the whole universe has been sort of rube goldberged into the position where <laughs> he just throws it naturally and it just happens to to bonk the the wolf right in the head i mean i i kind of my my intuition is to agree with you that it seems like god's finger is kind of just nudging the the mallet but i i think that's like exactly the point is you can't really say for sure it could just be a lucky throw right yeah no i i I agree i think i think i would i would agree with the idea that it was just a good throw if if we really didn't harp on the fact over and over again about how johnny you know in in his like this is used as his example of his like final resistance to this idea right in that like he's trying to say no 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 it was just a lucky throw and then in the back of his mind he's like no no that that's not right like you know it was going high like so it does it does seem like there's some some finger on mallet happening yeah, here. Yeah. Especially because dogs have really thick skulls. So Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I, I thought about that too. Is like how powerful would you have to throw that thing to, yeah. to immediately kill a, a freaking right. wolf? I, I I was honestly thinking about this time when I was a kid and our 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 Labrador, which is a fairly big dog, was running around and my dad had it was just standing there and he had his arm hanging down and he had a hammer in his hand just he was just standing there he wasn't doing anything and the dog runs by him and my and my dad basically the, the hammer just like lifts up in, in, in to about chest level 
because the dog has collided headfirst with the <laughs> head of the hammer fast enough to just knock it away, which when you think about it is mechanically roughly equivalent to just dropping the hammer from that height onto the dog's head, which would be yeah. quite, but the, the funny thing is the dog just kept running on, didn't react at all, <laughs> never had any issue. Um, and, and, and so I, I was, I was thinking about this story when I, when I thought about the idea of hitting a dog in the head with a hammer, I'm like, or a wolf, which is going to have an even thicker skull. I'm like, yeah. man, that's going to hit really hard. <laughs> and that's probably the thickest point of the skull too, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, mm-hmm. that front part right there? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. So I don't know. The point is wolf is dead. God exists. Hooray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I love that David shows up right, right after this. And like, I love David's attitude in this scene here, Matt, because it, it's not like, it's not like a sense of gloating. He's not like, like, huh, 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 I told you so. It's just like, he has this extreme confidence that something magical and powerful and important just happened here. And he's just like, like smirking at Johnny in that specific kind of way. I really, I really like it. Yeah. It hits a particular sweet spot that. I don't know. I guess you could call it justified arrogance, sure. Um, but it doesn't come across negatively. You know, David isn't cruel about it. He's, he, you know, he, he's no more cruel than he has to be. I guess because mm-hmm. the the message he's delivering is sort of a a message of like, you know, this is your fate. This is inexorably going to happen. Just submit. <laughs> but but David himself is not being. Um, He's not he's not rubbing it in as much as maybe he could, considering how yeah. how much yeah. of a dick um, uh, Johnny has been recently. Totally, totally. <clears throat> um, and and I, I love how this scene plays out too, because you know David returns Johnny's wallet. He tells him what he's learned, and the way King writes this scene again, it's not a battle. Like there's not a conflict between David and Johnny really at this point, like where they're both kind of verbally sparring with each other and making arguments. It's more of just like a wave. Like David is here. The return of the wallet represents a a, a wave of a god, if we want to call it that. Um, And you can almost see that the the result of this thing is almost a foregone conclusion even before it starts. Like one of the earliest things we see here is the text says he could feel stuff starting to move inside him. Terrible stuff sliding like an avalanche beginning under a surface that only looks solid. Why did the boy have to come? Because he was sent, of course. It wasn't David's fault. The real question was, why couldn't this boy's terrible master let either of them go? So, yeah, like this feeling of, you know, you can't stop what's, ha- what's going to happen here. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're powerless, basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. David explains something to us that we've probably maybe been asking about in the back of our heads, or maybe you have. How, how, how was it that Johnny was in the land of the dead, even though he's here? still very much living um and and the answer to that question is well he did die right technically i think david says here when a person stops changing stops feeling they die so it's more of like a a, a metaphysical death here his his soul died in a way yeah so this is one of those points that <clears throat> maybe you can just explain it to me and i'll feel totally different about it but um I think I was expecting it to be a little bit more um, cut and dried. Like, like I was expecting there to be a fairly clear answer to the, to the mystery of like, what, what happened to Johnny? How, how did he end up here? Um, how did he have, end up in this situation? You know, I, I would even accept the idea that he metaphorically dies, but I still, I still kind of feel wanting for an answer of like, okay, but w- why did he, metaphorically die like did some specific thing happen was it just his lifetime of the things that he saw in vietnam um it, it, you know I, I feel like i'm being too literal is the thing and and like this is the thing i'm kind of annoyed with myself even because because <laughs> i i normally actually like it when king gets poetic or really when 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 storytellers get poetic and it's like look you're not don't be so literal this is meant to be a poetic statement about humanity. It doesn't really matter what happened to Johnny. So I simultaneously get that. And I'm also like, okay, but then why did we build up all those details about Vietnam and the guy with the cut wrists and, and the, uh, the, the, the Viet Cong lookout and all these things, if, if, if it's just going to end up sort of not mattering and it's just going to be a metaphor? Or maybe I'm just kind of missing something. I, maybe you can help me kind of sort myself out here. 
Well, no, no. So I think I think what you're experiencing here is is it, it feels kind of intentionally vague, like mm-hmm. that is. And I'm not prepared to just call it a metaphor, but just like, it, was there one singular event in Johnny's life that made him turn his his life off? And and the answer is, I mean, maybe, but we don't really shine a light on it very much. Like, yes, he went to Vietnam. He was obviously very affected by what happened to him in Vietnam. Um, but we don't really ever sit with that very much. Yes, he has a, a scar on his wrist as if he attempted to take his own life. Yes, that happened. But again, we don't we don't see that moment. We don't flash back to that moment. Yes, he was a drunk, uh, a, a womanizer, a, a, a woman abuser. Like, I, I think this is really interesting because one of the things I said at the very beginning of this book was like that I really dislike these faith based stories and 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 movies that are like you know every atheist out there is just a former believer that had like one bad thing happen to him and then he stopped believing in god and then the point of the book is like a, a, a believer coming to him and being like no no but don't you see he loves you and then <laughs> and then everything's great um and it feels to me in some ways like king is almost annoyed with that idea as well and is like trying to actively avoid that kind of thing where it's not just one single solitary event that turned johnny because i mean the other thing we do see is that that when they sing when they say the lord's prayer at the end of the book johnny like falls into that like from memory right and so obviously at one point in johnny's life he either was religious or was was at least attending church regularly enough to have the lord's prayer kind of memorized in his head but but I do I do kind of agree with you that it it seems like it is it is nebulous and unspecific, like what what happened to him like what happened to Johnny yeah. well he he experienced something awful yeah right I mean because part of me is like well we all we all we all experience bad things in our life and we don't all you know end up with a shade of ourselves in the land of the dead presumably or you know mm-hmm. maybe we do maybe. 70% of grown adults in the USA have a land of the dead shade. Um, <laughs> but, but like it, 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 it kind of removes the sting of, of the metaphor of having a, a ghost in the land of the dead. If it's like, Oh, well, it's really just about like a fairly moderate form of, of stasis and stagnation. Um, yeah. I was thinking a lot about like in, in English class in high school, we, uh, we read Death of a Salesman, and and for what for whatever reason, Death of a Salesman always stuck with me. I think it was maybe one of the first stories that I like felt like I really understood on the on the proper level, like on the level that that you and I like to talk about things rather than just like expecting it to entertain me, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Death of a Salesman is, according to my high school English teacher, about stagnation equaling death. Stagnation is death. Is the thesis statement of the story. I think that's makes sense still. Um, and so I was thinking about that because I'm like, well, yeah, so Johnny is somebody who is, has been in a, a lengthy period of stagnation, which is equivalent to death and metaphorically is death in the, in the frame of this story. So it's like, okay, it's just like death of a salesman. Sure. I, <laughs> I, I get all that. I was, and, and now I'm repeating myself, but I guess I was just left a little bit like, okay, but why, why, you know? Yeah. So, so to to be as as charitable as possible, I, I think a lot of the point of this is not necessarily, you know, what what is the thing that happened to you, but the the point is how did you react to the thing, right? Because mm-hmm. I think to, to your point, everyone goes through moments uh, of of intense hardship in their lives. That's part of life. Life is cruel, right? Um, and and we all we all go through these things where life is is very difficult and challenging, and and we struggle. Um, but but the, what matters is how you react to those things, and it, and it's clear, you know, even if we don't know exactly what what the things that Johnny went through were, we don't have the specifics. We do have the specifics of how he reacted to them, which was he he turned it all off. He stopped living. He started running from everything, and mm-hmm. and and running into into substance abuse, and and running into um you know his his violent temper, and he just became something else and i and i think to to me that is that is the overarching point of this whole thing i i think the problem and, and i think what you're getting to here the problem that this whole thing creates is you find yourself in this moment asking the question okay i get that but 
what was it about this moment in particular that caused that switch to flip back the other way? Yes. Right. Like, <clears throat> and again, like from a, from a, you know, a, a high level metaphorical view of, uh, of this whole thing is, is, is this is, you know, you, 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 you have found you're not alone again, right? David comes back for you. David comes to deliver your wallet and, and he, he brings with him evidence of, of something more powerful and, and that has an effect on you. And again, like the, 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 what we talked about, the wave of the wave of God overcoming you, but, but I feel like in a story you need, like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be asking myself that question at this moment. Like, why, why this moment? Why now? You know, like o- outside of well, we're in a story, and this is the climax of the story, and and so this yeah. is the moment it's going to happen. Right. I mean, what did Johnny or sorry, what did David say that was so persuasive in this moment that was different from what David had said previous to this moment? Um, yeah, and. Like what, what, what's so special about the wallet? Like he sees an old picture of himself that he presumably has been carrying around in his pocket for his whole life. Why, why does it jolt him this time? And I really like, I think, I think you're right. I think that, um, that to me is why the, the whole scene, it just doesn't, I mean, honestly, it feels like a scene that's built to create a feeling of catharsis and transcendence. And for me, it just left me a little bit like, Oh, that was it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it, uh, that that is one thing I did not remember about this book. I kept waiting. Like I was afraid to say too much because I kept waiting for like the sh- the other shoe to drop as far as the specifics of what happened to Johnny, and it and it it just never comes. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I will say like I I enjoy so much of the scene, right? Like we didn't talk about it yet, but like I love this one part where David says to him, "If you leave now, Tack will be waiting for you in a lot of places." Not just in Austin, hotel rooms, speaking halls, fancy lunches where people talk about books and things. When you're with a woman, it'll be you who undresses her and Tack who has sex with her. And the worst thing is that you may live like that for a long time. Candelac is what you'll be, heart of the unformed. Me, him, can, any, the empty well of the eye. And I think this is one thing where we're not talking about literal here, right? It's not like Tack is literally going to be with you in these moments. This is like the idea of Tack, the idea of evil, the idea of these things, like the, this, this this violence destructive tendency. If if you if you keep running from everything, this will consume you totally. Um, yeah. And, and so, like, there's an argument to be made here that okay, that's what finally did it, right? That's what finally, like, the, the realization that, oh, that's true, that I've seen, I've seen in, in Trajan and, and and then later Tack, I've seen this kind of manifestation of the worst parts of myself. Um, and, and, and then I've seen the other option. In, in David, I've been given the other option from a God that is going gonna, is gonna to frankly treat you like shit, but, but, it, it, it's it's still better <laughs> yeah and and that's what does it but yeah i mean t- my critique here would be i just don't think he nails that quite enough yeah yeah and i think uh, you know i think we're basically just kind of done complaining about this but uh-huh. I, I i think i think it did merit a bit of complaining because i i feel like this is what the book has been building up to and then it and then it lands in a way where i was kind of like okay i yeah. guess and that feels I still enjoyed this book a ton, but I think I think I like it it could have genuinely taken this book from like an eight to like a ten if uh if this moment had actually landed for me, you know. Yeah. And I think one thing that's cool about this book though is that like once you you get past this part where you're like, eh, I don't know how I felt about that. I think everything from here on out is great. Like you mm-hmm. just kind of accept that, okay, this is what we're doing. And now he's had this turnaround. Yeah. Everything, everything that plays out after this plays out beautifully and perfectly. And it, it and, and everything that we've been building to there, I think pays off wonderfully. Um, yeah. It's just a little, yeah. little bit. Yeah. I don't really have any more gripes past this point. So yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Um, I just, on that passage you just read, I just, think it's really interesting how the, like the, the repetition of the um uh the i want to say the dark speech the um the the, the speech of the dead the sort of midworld-esque speech the 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 me him can any it's sort of first time you hear it almost strikes you as like silly baby talk like it, <laughs> it, it, it it's no you know ashnaz where like it's constructed to sound evil it but but 
through repetition, it like begins to resonate and begins to sound evil, like due to the things it's associated with. Sure. And, until like at this point when he says Candlelatch, me him canto, I'm like, sh- you know, creepy. You know, it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's evil. That's some evil shit right there, David. And um, which is which is kind of cool and not really something I I don't know expected to happen where. I've just kind of created these associations with these nonsense phrases. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I just wanted to comment on that, how, how, I, how I enjoy that, actually. I, I like um, that. I like that, um, that it's it's kind of – I agree with you. It, it felt very silly at first. And then, um, I don't know, there's, there's so, so much attached to it at this point. The, I mean, just uh, something I was thinking about is like I think most people who read the book pronounce it as talk, not tack, because there's something more um, – serious <laughs> about <laughs> about the vowel sound you know the 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 it, it sounds it's, it sounds it sounds more it's a more appropriate name for a horrible demon would be talk you know but uh-huh. king king pronounces it 100 percent tack this sort of sort of like short a yankee accent <laughs> type which, which um again it begins to seem creepy and fearsome by the end of the book but it's it almost is like a it's like a strange sound to be the name of a demon the first time you hear it you know sure sure yeah i don't know why i pronounce it tack i'm i because i've never listened to it and it just i don't know maybe i was just responding to you and i've never actually pronounced it that way i don't know yeah i don't know i don't know who knows um so we go back with um with with johnny and david as they they get, uh, or sorry, no, I, I, I miss some stuff. I, I want to talk about uh, Tack still chasing Mary um, mm-hmm. because we have this moment where Tack is like chasing after Mary in the Ellen body, like almost catching her. Mary trips. It's like a really intense scene. Tack almost catches her and just misses her just by like literally a hair. Um, and and then the Ellen body finally dies, leaving Tack trapped or or almost trapped, right? Because in its final moments, uh, Tack transfers to an eagle yep america yeah i mean maybe but on the other hand scott <laughs> it's not a bald eagle so no nothing to do with america you're totally wrong well i, I mean like look if if king wanted to make this a clear like america metaphor like he would have right like uh-huh. he would have said like he would have called it a bald eagle right and then we would yeah. have been like oh yeah we're doing something but so let's go let's move beyond the the line of uh intentional um and uh-huh. and move to to unintentional sure. we have had a lot of you know with the american west as the movie theater we've had a lot of america imagery and we know the king stories tend to also talk at least somewhat about you know america as a concept and and the, the good the good and bad of that the stand being the clearest example of of this kind of examination so i don't know there is something to <laughs> in my mind to tax final form final symbol being one that is also uh, a symbol of our country kind of sort of yeah well yeah no i, I was joking in, in being dismissive i i think um so, so think about it in terms of like other ways you could have gone right he could have done a rattlesnake um yeah right like that would have been in some ways perfect because it's like uh, you know is one of the many creatures that people named in our, you know, some previous week where we asked about creepy desert animals. There's abundant creepy desert animals um, that he could have jumped into. I think a rattlesnake would have made a ton of sense because he, he could have, you know, definitely killed whoever it was that he bit mm-hmm. uh, with his one strike. But an eagle was on no one's list because eagles are not creepy. Eagles are awesome and badass. And, um, you don't really even think of them as being dangerous, even though a golden eagle is a giant bird with talons the size of your hand that could kill you if it wanted to. It just never does. Yeah. Um, and um, and so the idea that King chose an eagle, which is a distinctly non-scary creature, uh, I think you're, you're right to ask whether this means something. And I, I think there's something there. Yes. Yeah, I mean, distinctly non um, non scary and distinctly non low right like we mm-hmm. were kind of told that it is it is the low creatures that mm-hmm. the attack is summoning to him you know it is the the bugs and the the, the vermin and the, mm-hmm. the the buzzards you know like these are all like the 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 the, the gross ones for lack of a better term yeah. yeah 
and, and that eagle just seems so so opposite of that like almost almost by design it's not a low creature it's a it's a high creature it goes really high up in the air um and then dive bombs into you um mm-hmm. so yeah it seems like it is is intentional like yeah you're absolutely right that he could have picked anything anything else it could have been a buzzard if he wanted to do a bird thing like mm-hmm. it, it's it's not he picks an eagle a majestic beautiful creature um that he corrupts into murdering a young boy's father yeah i mean one could even argue that the reason it does a shit job of killing the boy is because it's like a unsuited host to, to the demon sure. you know yeah yeah um i don't know i don't know i don't know I, i'm curious what everyone else thinks about this because i don't i don't want to put too much i don't want to put too much into the book that i don't think is there because again i i really do feel like if king wanted to make a clear america metaphor he could have made it a lot clearer and i feel like king would have done that but maybe there's something unintentional here maybe you know th- he he reached for an animal and the first one that popped into his head was eagle and that's interesting yeah and and worth worth well so so in a in a totally different sense i will say i just thought that that was a really cool moment um just just sort of from the enjoyability standpoint uh-huh. because you know you're part of you really wants tack to just die and stop bothering these people because he sucks um, but there's a part of you that's like aware that that's not going to happen because the book has sort of indicated that things are not going to just wrap up so nicely. And so you're like, well, how's he going to get out of this one? <laughs> and, and then I just love the way it's written where I, I don't have the text in front of me, but it's like a, a winged shape comes down from the sky that, and he, he like pulls it down to him. And yeah. you're like a winged shape. Like, what is that going to be? And like, for for some reason, I think kind of along the lines of what you're saying, you're thinking about these like gross, shitty animals that he's been using this whole time. Um, and it's it's this majestic eagle. And it's just such a surprising moment that in retrospect, you're like, well, yeah, sure. They're big eagles in the desert. Totally. That's totally a thing that is t- totally a realistic thing that could happen here and totally surprised me. And so on that level, I was like, oh, shit. And, and <laughs> like, this is this is going to be this is going to be awful for our heroes. Yeah. I'm so excited. Hey, do you remember that uh, Denzel Washington movie Fallen? Oh, I love that movie. <laughs> it, th- this reminded me of that, right? Where mm-hmm. I guess spoilers for a 1990 something movie. But yeah, um, there's a demon that possesses people through touch. And uh, Denzel Washington attempts to defeat it by luring out into the middle of nowhere, having it go inside his body and then killing himself right right and then it jumps to like an animal at the last minute and it's it's one of those classic like this actually ends bad yeah and, and the, the bad guy wins uh yeah. thing uh it re- very much reminds me of this yep yep, yep, yep. that's a that's a real kick in the nuts movie yeah. <laughs> it was one of the first movies i saw as a kid that like just ended with the good guys losing and i was like oh man this sucks but also like i, I kind of like it yeah Totally. Uh, so we're back with Johnny and David as they get into the ATV to meet back up with the others. Um, and, and I like this part here. You know, we, we talked about Johnny's, you know, realization, but he's still not all the way there. Right. And we get this moment as as he ran it out through the open door. It occurred to him that none of this was happening. It was all just part of an idea he'd have for a new novel, a fantasy tale, perhaps even an outright horror novel, something of a departure for John Edward Marinville either way. Not the sort of stuff of which serious literature was made, but so what? He was getting on, and if he wanted to take himself a little seri- little less seriously, surely he had a right. Um, man, I just can't get over the fact that King like keeps like insulting himself uh-huh. through this character, and and I think part of his construct of John Marinville is like he's an asshole, and everything he says is bullshit. So like, I get that, but I also again to to hit this drum again, I do feel like King has some like deep seated insecurity <laughs> towards his selected lane of of storytelling sometimes mm-hmm. that, that sometimes rises to the surface of some of his his books yeah i mean i i've thought sort of this whole book that marinville is like the part of himself that has a chip on his shoulder about not being taken sufficiently seriously about uh, as this literary lion um which and and maybe this is his exploration of like okay well how would that have gone actually like if Stephen King had gone that route and, you know, it's, instead of releasing Carrie, he writes some, uh, you know, National Book Award winning 
uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know, s- s- something with weird sex stuff in it, right? Because that's <laughs> that's what you have to do to. I think to get... he does plenty of that, though. That's yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> He's well, trying. Yeah, he is. He is trying. He, uh, King is very literary, as we've discussed. You just um, can't also put a clown in your weird sex stuff book. That's that, the, that's the mistake he makes. That's true. That's true. I don't. I don't know, man. There's a, there's a formula that obviously King is not getting when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> literature. Like less clowns, more weird sex stuff. Yeah, you'll get there. Um, you'll get there, kid. Uh, <laughs> um. But um, yeah, like I, I think I think he's kind of exploring this idea of of himself as like maybe how it could have been uh, with with John Marinville to some degree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. One of the other things he says in this moment is that he has children. Um, <laughs> I'm not I'm not entirely sure, but I think this is like the first time in the book he's mentioned that he had kids before. I'm um, and, 90, and, and it, yeah. the implication is more than one, right? It, yeah, it's kids. Yeah, I'm 90% sure that you're correct that he has a I think he has a kid in college and another one like graduated and and it slapped me in the face in this moment. I think I immediately texted you <laughs> that, that I was like it's so poetic that he functionally forgot that he even has kids until he undergoes this sort of ritual of rebirth and his yeah. soul is is reawakened and you know, well young Johnny Marinville who went to Vietnam didn't have any kids, so therefore the Johnny we've been spending time with doesn't have kids effectively because he hasn't changed. He hasn't grown these, he's in total stasis and stagnation. And then, you know, he, he's reborn, you know, in the sort of, sort of biblical tradition, he's, he's baptized or, or has a, um, what's, what's the word? What's the word I'm I'm reaching for? Um, he's reborn, I guess is the word, um, reborn in Christ or whatever. And, and now he, now he remembers that he has kids. (laughs) Um, it's 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 perfect. I love it. I feel so bad for those kids. Their childhood must have sucked. I agree. Um. So the the two chat as they drive back. The talk turns, of course, to the cruelty of God. Uh, David tells Johnny the story of his best friend Brian and the promise he made. I, I I think what what we're doing here, kind of rather cleverly, is David is setting up the idea that his debt to God is coming due. And I think it becomes clear, maybe not here, but very soon after this moment, that David is planning on his death at the end of this thing, that he feels like, you know, this is a promise he made, a debt, a debt he owes, and he's, he's gonna, he's not gonna welch on the bet. He is, um, like he's the type of person that doesn't welch. He makes an agreement. It, it, it's Bush not to pay what you owe, he says, and it's Bush not to do what you promise. And mm-hmm. so this is where we're, we're laying the seeds for the eventual. And David thinks that it's his job to die here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think born again was the phrase I was looking for. There you go. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I like, I, I like this inner, action between david and johnny here like it's kind of what we've wanted from the book the whole time where we've set these two characters kind of at odds with each other all along in some way or another and everything has come to a head and now they're really on the same side and i mean even though johnny past this point is sort of maneuvering around david it's like at least at least this moment in time they're having this pleasant you know father son almost level conversation that's pleasant and, and satisfying so this is a, a real moment of satisfaction for me yeah they're very they're very, very briefly equals here i agree with mm-hmm. you like in the, in the moments leading up to this david is kind of on a mission from god and and so he's kind of in control uh r- immediately following the god bomb the situation reverses and johnny kind of takes control um, but in this moment they are peers and equal and they're they're joking around with each other like he you know david calls him old man they're like they're, they're kidding around it, it is this wonderful relationship that that you're right you know maybe i how do you realize this but i i wanted this to be here the entire time right right i also really like this the bad thing isn't that god would put me in a position where i'd owe him a favor but that he'd hurt brian to do it god is cruel david nodded and johnny saw the boy was on the verge of tears he sure is better than tack maybe but pretty mean just the same <laughs> you know like it's I just there are things in this story that are like, you know, we're going to highlight the differences between God and Tack and like how they're so different. 
and then the other thing it's doing is like also we're going to highlight the ways in which they are very similar in some regard <laughs> and this is one of those it's like b- better than tack maybe <laughs> right yeah. like like yeah b- better than this this pure evil incarnate thing but just just by like a little bit <laughs> Yeah, from the human perspective, certainly, especially if you don't have access to the perspective that would justify God's actions, at least as, as far as the, the story is concerned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this is the moment where Johnny gets a God bomb, um, which, of course, we recognize from the Dark Tower, uh, is mm-hmm. a phrase we used in that. We we actually don't get to see what he learns in this God bomb until later, but we do see that he manages to pass this off to David as a mild seizure. He God wasn't talking to him. He just had a seizure. I think this is interesting, Matt, because King holds this reveal for a little bit, right? We learn the truth of, of what, what Johnny knows slowly over the course of the next chapter. But I think he also kind of gives us just enough subtext here that you can maybe guess that like David feels David feels his fate is to die on behalf of his God here. And Johnny has just been told something else. And and like, why else, why else keep it a secret? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think pretty much right after the God bomb, I started putting stuff together. I, I don't know whether it was in this chapter or early in the next chapter that I started to become certain that Ralph would be the one to die. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was somewhere around here, though. Um, I think at this point, I was still holding out hope that Johnny would make it at least <laughs> because of my grand uh, Johnny becomes a prophet theory. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I was like, yeah, either Ralph's going to die or like Tax going to try to kill Ralph and he's going to barely survive or something. But nah, I was actually like, I was actually at this point, like the whole God is cruel thing kind of doesn't make sense. Unless you also kill Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ralph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we move from here into chapter five, the final chapter of this part, and and basically serving as the climax of our novel. Uh, it begins once again with Tack in eagle form, witnessing the reunion between the two groups and then flying into the China pit to hide and wait. And so is this the part, Matt, where you were like, oh, there's, there's an eagle down this tunnel. Um, I know what's going to happen now. Yeah. I mean, yes, I I was, I I figured it would go for David and Ralph would, would protect David and it would kill Ralph. Like I, I, I know I don't get any credit for it because I didn't have time to make the prediction, but I, I, (laughs) I, I, I don't even think King is particularly trying to hide this idea from us. I think he's telegraphing exactly what's going to happen and then just making it really horribly tense knowing, you know, basically bracing for that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Cause like I said, God is cruel makes way more sense if you leave the boy, you know, an orphan with no family left at all. If he has his father, it's like, well, yeah, that was pretty cruel, but could have been <laughs> crueler. Um, yeah, I mean, losing your mom and sister, that's nothing. But your dad, too? Yeah, that's just a whole nother order. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that's fair. And obviously, I, I, I agree with you that as I think King is kind of telegraphing us uh, as we're, as we're moving towards it. So back with Mary, who who honestly, in her way, kind of becomes almost like a second or third protagonist in the story. Like mm-hmm. she's the one we started with and she's the one we, in a way, finish with a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we see here that she survived her ordeal barely. And once again, we get these beats, these recurring beats about how this changes a person. She says, I ran for my life, she thought, and that's something I'll never be able to explain, not by talking, probably not even in a poem, how it is to run not for a meal or medal, or prize, or to catch a train, but for your very fucking life. And so, yeah, this has been the recurring beat with this character, right? This idea that she's gone through this this transcendent experience and, and experienced things that most people don't experience, and how this has fundamentally changed her. And we talked last week how this is, I think, you know, part and parcel of this idea of cruelty as as being refining. That that this is this is a character who is who is experiencing these things, looking at these things as experiences, and noting how they are changing her. Yeah, I I do think it's interesting in this moment. The, the thought that jumped into my head at this moment, and, and maybe this is an unfair thought. I don't know, but I was like, I wonder how King feels about this post accident. You know, mm-hmm. th- this book was written in 1996, 
and and I'm not saying King hasn't gone through his own trials and tribulations like uh, up until this point, right? I think I think being an addict and and getting clean from your addiction is a very 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 difficult thing, and it's a thing that he struggled with for a while and succeeded at. But like, it's not like an acute specific one of event of trauma like almost dying and having to recover from that is you know like like i I just one of the questions i want to ask him is like in 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 looking back at at your accident now was that there was that random act of life's cruelty refining for you like like did did you walk away from that that experience going like you know that was awful but like it changed me for the better ultimately you know i don't know yeah yeah, I, I don't either. I mean, we definitely we sort of see his thoughts on some of these issues in the Dark Tower, and I could probably hammer out a, a good response to you if I had if I had time to think about it. <laughs> but but I, I, I you know the, the whole the, you know this whole book, as we've talked about before, and I'm sure we'll talk about even more next week on our retrospective, was you know a, a prolonged meditation you know essay on the concept of theodicy Mm -hmm. the idea of how can there be such horrible evil in a world where god is present that's not quite the right formulation of theodicy but that's kind of the question that that king is struggling with here Mm -hmm. and and he comes you know in this book it basically comes down to this idea of like it can be it can be very hard to see but you know there is a force of good in the world and and the, the you know maybe you'll never know the final reasons for the things that it does, and maybe even within your life it'll all just sound like a horrible tragedy and, and a waste, and you'll die cursing God. But you know your your death was in service of something greater and was fighting some much worse evil, um, and it'll all be worth it in the end. And you, and fundamentally though, all that being said, you kind of just have to have faith that this is true because you'll never really know for sure. Yeah. Um, even if you're somebody like David who, you know, knows for sure about as about as close as anyone can, um, you're still going to be left with this horrible. I mean, it's interesting. David's doubt isn't like, does God exist? David's doubt is more like, is God good? Yeah. Um, like it's almost like the more, you know, about God, the more un- unsure you are about, about that question instead. Um, as for you know, I, I so that's what he's trying to do with this book, right? And it's like, theoretically speaking, it seems like well, just you know, if a particularly horrible thing happens to you, and you have this framework in your head, it makes sense that you could just be like, well, yeah, I mean, this is there's there's got to be some reason for this. There's got to be some got to be got to be some uh, uh, silver lining to this to this cloud here. And um, and I don't know. I, I don't want to come down too hard and say like, yes, that's that's why the Dark Tower incorporates the accident into it. As he's he's making lemonade out of lemons, he's <laughs> he, he's he's turning he's turning this tragedy in, into you know something that the turtle is sending him down the beam and making meaning out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, it it feels like it's in the ballpark. Yeah, I I like everything you just said there a whole lot. I think one of the interesting things to me is that like, you know, when you talk about faith and religion and God and these things, a lot of times the conversation is like, you know, do do good here, believe in God here, and, and you will be rewarded eternally, right? Like the, the concept of heaven is this is this, you know, this this thing that exists um that you know, despite all the cruelty and hardship and difficulty and evil that you experience in your life, it, it'll all be OK in the end because you'll be in heaven for eternity. And this book does not hold to that idea. Right. Like like where's the, our characters get a very vague sense of of any kind of idea. And, and I think even David has said multiple times, that like, you know, if, if there is anything beyond like he's not even fully convinced in his in his love of God that, that there is anything beyond this life. Mm-hmm. Um, and the book seems very, very focused on right now on not the eternal reward not not anything that happens after your death but your actions and your choices and and the things that happen to you right right this minute um and Mm -hmm. yeah incredibly cruel incredibly tough incredibly difficult um and and it's not you know believe in god because if you do you'll get through this stuff and be rewarded but believe in god because 
because it's the right thing to do and and because you know you you will be equipped and and empowered with the ability to make it through these things one way or the other um mm-hmm. and 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 help other people like i think that like what david does for johnny here despite the fact that johnny dies is in in essence saves his soul not not like again not so his soul can go to heaven but just this is a man who has been dead for decades and he gets to before he dies actually for real he gets to be alive briefly and do something and david did that for him god didn't do that for him i mean god did through david but like this david provided it was the catalyst for this uh, reawakening in a man who had basically spent the last the last decades of his life being worthless or next to worthless and I don't know that that to me you know, again remove the word God out of it. That to me is the point of life is is help people, be kind to people, you know, prop people up. You know, there, there's there's a lot of terrible shit, shit in this world, and we have no control over it most of the time. But what we we do have control over how we can choose to react to it. Love that. Yeah, uh, I think I think actually what you just said there sort of. Um, proactively addressed a gripe that I was going to have later. <laughs> um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up again when we get to that point sure, and then I'll, sure. I'll explain what I meant about how, how maybe you just changed my mind actually. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, so David talks to the group outlining the responsibilities here, close the antac, close the drift, bury it. I really love this moment where Johnny asked the question, well, what happens when the desperation mining company comes back? Won't they just like dig it all up again and we'll have the same problem? And I love how David almost giddily replies, well, that's not our fucking problem, is it? That's uh-huh. God's problem. It's great. I love it. Yeah. I, 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 uh, yeah sorry, go sorry. ahead. I was just going to say, I, I remember a week or two ago when I specifically said that I was sure that they would have to like magically <laughs> close the rift because reburying it would just be so unsatisfying and you know well fuck me i guess because they're just gonna rebury it but it's- well it, that's the fascinating thing about this is isn't it unsatisfying like isn't it like an interesting narrative choice to just be like hey that's not what we're we've been told to do so that's not what we have to worry about we've mm-hmm. got to do our job this is our job everything else is someone else's job um and and that that feels narratively unsatisfying but it also it also perhaps speaks to a larger thing of no single person is going to be able to solve every problem in the world, right? Like, yeah, you, yeah. you do the thing you can do, and then you can't you can't like allow yourself to be completely consumed or or burdened down by the things you cannot do. Yeah, I like that, and and I also like the idea like you you it's arrogant to think that you can just defeat evil forever. Yeah, um, it, yeah. It, it, it would be sort of wrong to leave the book with the impression of like we have defeated evil. It's like no, no, <laughs> you, you, you give evil a significant setback, and which is which is kind of all a human can hope for. Yeah, um, in this mortal world of ours, for sure, for sure. So on their way back down to the China Pit, they stop and and pick up and move the corpse of Ellen Carver to to move her off the road. And I like I found this part really moving. Like uh, like Ralph stands up, walks over to his son. He, he took his hands away from his face, wiped his sleeve across his eyes, and then came across to Mary's side of the truck and put his arm around David. David groped for his father's hand and took it. Ralph's stricken, streaming eyes met Mary's, and she began to cry herself. Like, it's just this this incredibly human moment of, we lost our mom slash wife, and it it's really sad. And and like, I, I think I think it matters because Mary Carver has been this monster for so long in the book that like maybe we needed a a reminder that also she was this, just this person that is dead now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I I think it's important here at this point to sort of bring us back down to the human level. um, Remind us of the basic gravity of, you know, losing a loved one without, Mm -hmm. I mean, the supernatural trappings are still sort of hovering around, but in this moment, we're not focusing on that. We're just focusing on the mundanity of loss, actually, um, yeah. which is how we all experience loss, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's important to take the time to do that, actually. I agree. I totally agree. Um, I also love that we take the time to do this, which is we have this moment where Mary looks at Johnny Marinville, and for her, perhaps the first time, all books, 
sees a person that she could kind of like while he wasn't trying to be an asshole, that is. Um, and I think this is no accident that this happens after his kind of embracing of life again, right? Like, I think the relationship between Mary and Johnny up until this point was was contentious the entire time, right? Like, she did not like him. She did not like him at all. She thought he was an asshole. She thought he was a jerk. She's constantly yelling at him. And then we get this moment where she's like, eh, he's not so bad. Um, yeah. That's that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, and then he was always sort of connecting her with these you know, uppity women of his past who yeah, talked back yeah. to him too much and just sort of expressing the worst of his own nature whenever he thought about her. Um, and that seems yeah. to have died down. Man, you're absolutely right. This didn't occur to me. But in this moment, he quotes a book to her, right? Mm-hmm. And she says, I know what it's from. And and I and I feel like the old version of Johnny Marinville gets pissed off that this woman like is is maybe calling him stupid or mm-hmm. or something or 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 talking down to him but in this moment all he does is like continue to joke around with her about literature yeah um, he, he we we see no moment in johnny where he's like oh this bitch you know like he, he doesn't he doesn't do that and and i feel like it's it's a situation it's an event in which which the old johnny would have would have behaved that way or would have had that reaction but we see no such thing out of him in this moment yeah right basically he treats her as an equal um, for the first time. Yeah, yeah. So they get to the China pit, and before they go in, Mary walks up to Entragian's car and uh, rips the bobblehead bear off the dash and steps on it, smashing it. I love this as a symbolical kind of fuck you moment. And I love how the book describes it as having can toy eyes. Like this is this is not a, a canta, by the way. This is not a <laughs> this is not a, a a magic bear statue. This is just a plastic bobblehead that was on the dash of Entragian's car, one of the first things they see mary and peter when they get in the car and kind of the the uh, comparison the weirdness of the and the terror of the situation uh, intermixed with this goofy bobblehead is is something that stood out to them yeah yeah i love this moment um you know it, it, it's i don't know it feels meaningful it's, it's a great story moment just to say it's, it, i mean it's, it's sort of meaningful in its meaninglessness if that makes sense which uh-huh. it doesn't but it, it's a <laughs> it's a meaningless token but it's a, you know the gesture is a symbol of um I, you know like you said it's a symbol of her kind of spitting in the face of of this tragedy that happened to her yep yep all right so uh, as they prepare to enter the shaft um they they uh we realize matt in this moment this is why Ghost Johnny let David know so much detail about the intricacies of the desperation mining operation. It's because he needed to teach him about what Anfo was uh-huh. and and how to use it. So that's yeah. why, Matt. That's why we learned all about the explosives and and the detail. Like it, there was a reason for all of yep. it. Yep, that's that, it, we needed the technical specs on how to blow up the mine. Makes <laughs> makes sense. Uh, but Ralph is elected to be the one to shoot off the lock of the Anfo shed. And this is, uh, because King realized he needed Ralph to do something here at the <laughs> end of the book. So I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I mean, Ralph does become 70% more of a character in this last stretch. Um, he does for, for sort of obvious reasons. He very briefly uh, steps to the forefront of the novel again, just in time to get, uh, his throat ripped out by a talent. Yeah. There are so few characters that he can't disappear to the <laughs> wallpaper anymore. You know who has disappeared? Cynthia. It's true. Is she like, I forgot she was in these scenes. Where is she? I don't know. I mean, I feel like there's a like sort of a geographical reason for that because they were in the, they were in the um, camper and oh, man, it's, it's been, it's, it's been almost a week since I read this. She's definitely um, here, Matt. Like she's here. Like she's uh-huh. not, not here. It's just, I feel like this book just drops character sometimes and in, in a way that I find really weird. Like, like if you would have told me at the beginning of this book, is the relationship between Steve and Cynthia going to be a core part of this story? I would have said, yes, a hundred percent. Absolutely. But is it not really? Yeah. I, I feel like there was some degree of gardenering happening where King had these ideas for these different characters and he threw them all into this big pot together and he was really interested to see how they'd bounce off each other. And in some cases, the alchemy just didn't quite work out and it was just like, okay, well, and and Cynthia is also there and Ralph is also there. Yeah. And, um, and I don't know how to fix that or even if it needs to be fixed. Like, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a quibble, right? I don't know if this is a, an actual problem, but I mean, I, I think to me, it feels like Ralph was written backwards to where he knew he was going to have this kid's dad sacrifice himself at the very end. So he needed him here till the very end, but didn't like Ralph doesn't have an arc in this book. Like, yeah. I, I guess the, the, the most arc you could give him is he goes from a person that isn't really trusting what's going on with this kid to a person that like ultimately like lets his son go. Um, yeah. Maybe what I'll say is that the, this is an atypical problem in a King book because mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think of one of his strengths as being managing a quartet of people who all have different, you know, needs and wants and, and they're bouncing off each other and there's, there's conversation and conflict and, and, uh, this is a strength of his as a writer. So, so it actually yeah. does stand out. I think, I think this is maybe what we're reacting to is it stands out when he sort of does the quartet thing and it just doesn't really work the, the same way. Um, and you, you feel like there are some balls being dropped here and there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, I, it is that it's so different from, from what we normally see for sure. So uh, Steve realizes something in this moment, by the way, Matt, uh, he realizes that Johnny has taken control of their team that david was in charge david was the leader david was the one directing them but suddenly johnny has taken control and he says to himself what changed what changed steve wondered and well i mean it's the fact that he's alive again kind of right um but but it's also the fact that god has kind of switched which uh which representative he's currently working with as well mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah um, so they get the info and, and Johnny asks to talk to Steve alone. And in this moment, he tells him that no matter what goes on down there, when he gives the word, pick up David and get him out of there. And I love this quote. He, he asked this thing. He asked to Johnny, do you suppose that's why God picked me in the end? Because an accomplished liar. That's sort of funny, but also sort of awful. You know what? <laughs> I love yeah. that. You know, like that, 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 God, and I think this is true in King that we've seen, right? That like we, we talked about this in in the Dark Tower that like Gan or the White or God uses everyone and uses their traits that perhaps aren't aren't so admirable, but uses yeah. them for its purpose. Yeah, I, I like that. I um, I mean, I, and I think he's not off base here because we did see him very successfully uh, mislead David in the car about having had a seizure. Um, it's like, yeah, I mean, it takes a pretty accomplished liar to to pull that off. Uh, I, I was thinking yeah. a bit about how, like, you know, what you just said about the the mantle of leadership passing. It's like when when Johnny, you know, died and then came back to life. It's like, well, now he's Johnny the White. <laughs> he's not Johnny the Gray anymore. And um, and and I've always thought it was interesting how, like, to be to be literal about it, like Gandalf the White was a lot less sort of soft and sweet and personable with yeah. with the hobbits than Gandalf the Grey was. They're they're kind of slightly different characters. Gandalf the White is a bit like sh sharper and yeah. more more focused on the mission. Um and so it's not just an objective straight up improvement, right? It's like you kind of lost something when you went from Gandalf the Grey to Gandalf the White. And I think I I I'm only half joking here really that like Johnny in his rebirth into being like a more suitable tool for God. It's not necessarily a, a, a across the board improvement um, in his character. Like some of his, some of his uh, sharper edge traits have also been amplified. You could say. Yeah. It don't with, and God doesn't require him to be a saint. He just yeah, requires yeah. him to be what he wants, what he needs him to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree with you. And actually uh, about to insult the Lord of the Rings films a little bit here, Matt, I, uh -huh. I think that's one thing that the movies didn't quite nail for me was mm -hmm. the difference in Gandalf the white. I feel like it did very early on when we first see him. Yeah. And then it just kind of abandoned it. And you, and you kind of understand why, like you want, you like this character and you want him to be warm and kind to other characters. Uh, and it's just not consistent, but uh, yeah, I agree. There we go. Insulted Peter Jackson. We're doing great today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one of those things where I, I think a, a, a person who don't only seen the movies would not even realize um, the distinction that I just tried to illustrate. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't want to get – we'll have a conversation about that another day. It's sure. definitely there in the movies. Like like the first time they meet Gandalf the White, 
he like looks at the hobbits almost as if he doesn't recognize them at first. Yeah. And he's like having to remember who they are. Right. Um, and I think that is Peter Jackson attempting to do what you're talking about here, but I think it gets kind of tossed aside eventually. I agree. All right. Um, so the other thing Johnny says here is that David thinks God means to sacrifice him in the final minutes to close the hole, but that David is wrong. Did you think in this moment uh, that it, that it would be Johnny that is the sacrifice? Did you had you clued into that yet? Well, I mean, I don't know about that. I like I. I st- I still thought that Ralph was going to die and mm-hmm. maybe I thought that Ralph is going to be the sacrifice in the sense of like, well, somebody's going to die. Might as well be the person who is the sacrifice. But that was a little simplistic. Um, I don't, th- I think I still, I think I was warming up to the idea that Johnny would die because he seems sort of hell bent on being the one to um, see this all to the end. Mm-hmm. But um I think I didn't want it to happen and I sort of saw it as like, but then, but then what was the point of all of this is kind of my, my <laughs> attitude about, I mean, I'll go ahead and say this now. Um, even though I guess it's slightly, slightly early it, it's just like, um, he's, he just got reborn. He's been mm-hmm. dead for what? 30 years, who knows? 20 years, 30 years, something like that. And he's born again. And he was immediately told five minutes after he was born again, okay, you got to go sacrifice yourself. And he's totally fine with it, or he's he's not totally fine with it, maybe, but he's essentially fine with it. And and there's no, you know, that just bothers me. Like, it just strikes me. It just rubs me the wrong way because I'm like, like, why are you happy about the idea that you're going to be dead in, in five more minutes? Like, shouldn't you be even more mad than ever shouldn't you be gnashing your teeth at god even more than ever at the, at the idea that god literally brought you back just so he could use you as a tool to to blow up like doesn't that seem i mean maybe may, and i guess it's supposed to it's supposed to seem super dark and fucked up <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, it, because it, god it is. is cruel yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but i i think the thing i don't the thing i the thing that bothers me is is why is johnny so cool with it and this is Okay, so so like this is the the thing you said earlier that I was kind of reacting to is like, well, well, God has saved his soul. God has 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 given him something to care about and to 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 live for again. Yeah, and so this is actually better than if he had lived out another thirty years of absolute stagnation before dying of alcoholism. This is this is actually better than that. This is actually a reprieve. Um, this is actually a form of grace. And, and I can get behind that. I think that just wasn't my first reaction at all. Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, to preface the conversation we're going to have at the very end of the story, you know, the idea that sometimes he makes us live. I don't think Johnny is just talking about David in that moment. Mm -hmm. I think he's talking about himself and the fact that he was, he he just was made to stay alive for Mm -hmm. 30 years of, of misery, um, which were all leading up to this moment. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I get what you feel. I, I didn't feel the same way because I did in my mind saw that as as, as like a moment of reprieve. It's actually a, it's actually a moment of grace and reprieve from his incredibly difficult life. And I can't like, do you do you want to leave your life, you know, being this miserable husk, or do you want to leave your life being, I don't know, the the purest best form of yourself, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I love how you just articulated that. I will say again, that's not how it struck me in the moment, but sure. but I, I I get it and I like it actually. I also really like this part. I don't know if this is King talking to his former self, but uh, Steve asks him, do you know how to set the shit off without any dino or blasting caps? You think you do, don't you? What's going to happen? Is God going to send down a lightning bolt? <laughs> like, I feel like the hand of God in the stand was one of the things that, I don't know if I'll say criticized because I haven't read like actual critic reviews of the stand, but like I, I, it was a complaint I saw a lot amongst readers was that that was the moment that just like, Oh, and then God literally appears to detonate a nuke at the end of the story, which isn't quite what happens, but it's close enough to what happens that like, I feel like this is King in, in conversation with himself. Yeah, that's very funny. That didn't occur, occur to me. Um, I mean, in the stand that felt like kind of a, there there were all sorts of other ways he could have gotten that nuke set off and he chose to make it like a, a very overtly supernatural event, which 
seem to be saying something in context of that story. But yeah, yes, I mean, this could very well be. I mean, we're specifically talking about the idea of supernatural intervention setting off a, a bomb to kill the to kill a demon. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it does line up really nicely yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right that this is sort of a little joke that he's put in here i do also like as they enter the china pit like we get this from from johnny speaking to our conversation we've had about him is it says yet he felt good everything was simple now that was sort of wonderful mm-hmm. um and and, and uh, this is uh, this is interesting because you know i i think there is there is something to I don't know the 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 trials and tribulations of life and the fear of 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 not knowing not knowing if what you're doing is right not knowing if like like I I do feel like religion and and God can sometimes give people a, a, a level of certainty that is comforting to them right it's like like life is complicated right like like just just live just like living and existing in this world is pretty complicated now like like mm-hmm. what is what is right like like if you if you want to ethically purchase stuff. How, how do you how do you do that in the world we live in today? How, how do you effectively do that? Well, can't <laughs> yeah. you, you can't really. And so this idea that like he, he's had this awakening, he's and he's gotten this purpose, and and so he, he's been gifted this purpose in this meeting towards the the very last minutes of his life, and and he what he feels there is a kind of serenity, a kind of a kind of wonder, um, yeah. yeah, and and simplicity to it all, and. Yeah, I, I I like it. Yeah, I think like you said before, that was not a that was not a kind of wonder and simplicity that he ever would have experienced unless he'd had this um, um, spiritual reawakening. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I mean, you imagine how the the that version of Johnny would have approached the same situation. I think he would have been angry and mad and furious and everything you you said uh, that you, that you kind of wanted him to be. Um, and and he might have still done it all, but he would have. He would have been miserable about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to keep harping on it, but I almost feel like if I had actually <laughs> bought his transformation from Johnny the Gray into Johnny the White in that moment, then I would have had a much easier time buying the idea that he had total serenity about all of this. Yeah. But because that moment, which I'm, you know, still fundamentally to me, the the linchpin of the story that doesn't quite go off properly, um, I think maybe that's that. That's why this. That's why I had this complaint. It's like a second order complaint. We needed a Balrog for him to fight. Is what you're saying. We needed a Balrog for him to fight. And he says, "Fly, fly you fools!" <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So as they make their way down, David stops them to pray one last time. Uh, they give the Lord's prayer here, and I, I, I don't like. I don't know why I love it so much, but I love that it starts with David saying, "Whose father?" And Johnny replying, "Our Father," um, and then they they recite the Lord's Prayer, which you know um, is is a prayer that you and I have said probably many 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 times throughout our lives. But but like like the other prayers that we talked about, the words have basically become meaningless. Um, the, the thing the thing that I liked here is that it felt like perhaps maybe for the first time in forever, the words meant something to them as they said them. Yeah. I like that too. I agree. Um, and then I love that. Uh, I think it's, is it Mary at the end or Cynthia that uh, adds the little, little Protestant twist on the whole thing? Yeah. Is that a Protestant thing? I, I, I feel like I've heard that. So the Catholics do an additional thing now too, after okay. this part, but I think it's slightly different and I don't know. They keep changing shit. Yeah. Like I haven't been to mass and, um, <laughs> a long, well, long, long time. Yeah. Well, so, so the way I feel like the way I learned it as a kid was the first part, and then the part that Cynthia says at the end was like a part that that they started doing in church when I was an adult. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "What? The, what? What is this? What are you doing? Just gotta this throw is, more in there." Yeah, they just gotta add more to make me feel incompetent. <laughs> so. I will say, like as powerful as this moment is, one of the the eeriest things in the world, and we talked about this with the uh, Apostles' Creed. Like one of the eeriest things in the world is listening to a large congregation of people, like monotonely uh-huh. reciting prayers without any emotion to it, because they've just heard the words and said the words thousands and thousands of times. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it is funny, I, and I think you know, interesting to point out that this would be the first time they said those prayers. 
and meant it because in pretty much every other context you say a prayer, it's like a performance yeah. of the prayer to one degree or, or another. Well, okay, you're, if you're like, you know, praying before bed or whatever, it's not a performance, but it's also just kind of a perfunctory ritual. Yeah. Um, it's, that, I mean, that, yeah. That, I don't want to throw any shade to any of our Catholics in our audience because because I, I love you all, but um, a Catholic Mass always just seemed like such a, it's such a scripted performance event. Like every Mass is the same exactly. There's like one moment in the Mass that you have slightly differently. The readings change right, and then there's the homily by the priest that is based on the readings that changes. But then like every other thing is just wrote like repetition of of sacrament and prayer and like these things it's like the first time i went to a church that was not catholic and like realized that like oh so like the whole thing is just the part where the priest talks that's like the that's like the whole that's the whole thing Mm -hmm. it's just the priest like just talking to you about what the word of god means to him and relating it to like whoa that's weird (laughs) yeah i mean i've also not been to church in 20 years but i i feel like (laughs) I feel like the um, there's some comfort that comes with the ritual, and sure, sure. I, I, it's you know, I don't know. I think there's, I, I don't know. I have complicated feelings about it. <laughs> I'll say that much. Oh, that's fair. And there, there's certainly yeah. comfort that comes with it here, right? Like yeah, they are, yeah. they are comforted by these words in this moment. Um, but once again, I have to like talk about how how weird it is that this is definitely a Christian God, right? Like they're they're reciting the our father the, which is a christian prayer um but like none of this seems very christian outside of these these random throw off references like they just don't talk about jesus very much i know we had that one scene where like like david mentions jesus but like we just don't talk about jesus very much in this book at all yeah it's true and also i mean even even the the prayer um doesn't have much to do with this exact moment, right? I mean, it's not it's not like there was a better prayer. It's not like there was yeah. a prayer where the like the prayer is like preparing to go fight the demon. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I don't know what my point is there, actually. It's just just that um it's a prayer to a god who doesn't particularly look a lot like the god that we've actually been interacting with in this book. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. David then tells everyone he's supposed to go alone, but Johnny calls him on his bluff saying David doesn't actually know that. And he says they're all going in together. Uh, Ralph can go right behind his son. David protests, but Johnny sets him straight saying what you want doesn't matter. Whew, that's rough. Yeah. Yep. 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 I mean, that's, I, 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 I do think this landed for me and by this, I specifically mean the idea that, David still hasn't actually understood how cruel God can be. Mm -hmm. And even though you see it coming, you know, especially I I think by this point, everybody sees it coming. um, You're, you're just like, okay, he, he will though. He will see how cruel God can be. Um, I I love like one of the things that I think is so powerful about this moment is I think Johnny knows that Ralph is about to die, right? Like he's been, share that information like we see that this this paragraph here he looked at david and his father standing side by side heads down hands entwined and it wasn't easy he could barely believe the enormity of what he was allowing could barely believe couldn't believe at all was more like it how else could he go on except with merciful incomprehension held before him like a shield how could anyone so like it seems like he knows like i'm gonna allow this thing to happen like i i know what's gonna happen and i'm going to allow it to happen um, yeah. And David doesn't have that same level of clarity, but it seems like Johnny does. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I mean, I think Johnny's an adult and maybe God knows that he can handle it and that he's going to do what needs to be done despite sort of the horribleness of it. Um, mm-hmm. it, it is interesting, like like there's there's actually a degree of you could say like respect here where God is he is going to use Johnny as his instrument, but he's going to give Johnny all the information and be like, okay, this is what we're doing. It's going to be really horrible. Yeah. And just so you know, you know, (laughs) uh, cause I don't know. It's, it seems more, I don't know the white coated to, um, to actually give them 
um, the information they need to make the informed decision rather than kind of springing it on them. Yeah, but um, like it's not as if this information was given to Johnny and Johnny can be like, well, I'm going to prevent it from happening, right? It's just yeah. like this is what's going to happen. Like th- th- that's it. Like it, yeah. this, it, this is the way it's going to happen. There's not anything you can do about it. Um, except, except go forward. Right. Uh, well, the, uh, yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. Which is weird. Cause I was, I admit this was distracting to me and this is probably just me being bad at reading books, but I was thinking like, okay, why don't you just put the motorcycle helmet on Ralph <laughs> and then you just have a stick and you be behind Ralph and then Ralph will protect the boy with his body, and then the the eagle won't be able to get at Ralph's neck, and then you hit the eagle really hard with the stick because it's just an eagle; it's got hollow bones. <laughs> Problem solved. But you're you're right that despite the fact that it does seem like one could have like war gained themselves out of the situation, um, Johnny his attitude is just like this is how it's got to be. This is how it's got to be. Yeah, and I guess to combat that i like i i I didn't get the feeling that johnny knew like the specifics of it like Mm -hmm. like the johnny knew like oh we're gonna walk around this corner and an eagle is going to attack and it's gonna rip out his throat like like i didn't get like johnny has obviously been given instructions he knows how this stuff's gonna to to play out the reason he's holding on to the the uh helmet is you know because of what the events at the very end of the book but Maybe he didn't even know why he was holding onto the helmet. It's yeah. just like just hold on. With this, the same thing with the shotgun shell, right? Like God tells David to pick up the shotgun shell, like but like he didn't say you pick up the shotgun shell because you, you, Johnny will later use this to set a bomb off. It's just like hey, get that, and it's like yeah. hey, bring bring the helmet. Hey, Ralph's gonna die. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I, I think there's that actually, you know, if you're right, it kind of makes it all seem even more horribly twisted that <laughs> they, they have a, they have a motorcycle helmet which is like the perfect thing that you would want to have if you were about to be attacked by an eagle because it's like yeah it can it can scratch you up and stuff but you've covered all of your vital stuff that an eagle mm-hmm. wants to go after or any sort of bird really um and so th- they have exactly the thing on hand but you know god god doesn't go out of his way to say <laughs> put the put put the put the helmet on ralph and then yeah. after you're done with that, take the helmet back. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it would have been damaged. Maybe it would have been damaged, right? Like maybe it just wouldn't have, maybe it would have gone differently, right? Maybe it just has to be this way and you just yeah. have to accept it on faith. And that's, that, that's, that's what I'm fighting against really is this idea <laughs> of like, you just kind of have to accept on faith that this is how it has to be. And I'm like, Th- no. This, yeah. This by the way is like what I always knew your reaction to this whole book was going to be. I uh-huh. like, I knew we were going to get here because you know, eventually in his book it does come down to this kind of shrug your shoulders this is the way it is right and and mm-hmm. that's and that's all there is to it and and i know you and i know that's not something that you you know agree with in in real life and so i i of course you're going to push against it when it's the focal point of our story and and i can accept it to the degree that it's properly sort of dramatized and, and i buy that the characters are are in it, which I mostly do for this story, you know, yeah, other yeah. than this sort of one point that I keep whining about. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do appreciate that like Ralph's death here is not like uh, Ralph has to die because God commands it. Ralph's death is Ralph sees his son in danger and finally is able to do something to protect his family, a thing yeah. that he has failed to do over and over and over again throughout the course of this book. Yeah. And it cost him his life, but it is the culmination of of what arc he does have. I mean, this is dark and this isn't the way I sort of think in my personal life, really. But one could see a vision of like, maybe this is the best way for Ralph to go. Like, <laughs> yeah, like maybe if Ralph goes on from here and he, he struggles, he's just a shitty father because he obsesses over um, the fact that he let his wife and daughter die because of his gambling habit or what, you know, what, whatever story he chooses to tell himself, mm-hmm. maybe this was actually the best way for Ralph to go out ultimately, even though it's, it seems horribly um, cruel. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess I, I don't d- disagree, but I guess like, I don't, I don't even know if in, in the context of the book, I'd put like the best way for Ralph to go out. Like mm-hmm. this is just the way, like th- mm-hmm. this is just the way it's going to like, yeah, it, yeah. it was always going to happen this way. And, like be, because of a combination of 
I don't want to call it destiny or fate or God or anything. This is just who, who Ralph is. And in the this, in this situation as it is, this is what's going to happen. Um, yeah. And and like, look, look, it Ralph's death here is very, very sad. Of course it is. And we have been uh, pretty mean <laughs> to Ralph Carver over the course of this book. But I do feel like at the end, like, I don't know. I have a lot of sympathy for him because like, what is it like to be the parent, the father of of of, of one tapped by God to do this important thing, right? Like, what is it like to be that? Um, mm-hmm. After all, like, tell me right now, Matt, uh, what happens to Joseph, father of Jesus Christ? I literally don't know. <laughs> Nobody does. Yeah. Nobody knows what happens to him. He disappears from the story. Um, we know about Mary, right? But at at, at Jesus's crucifixion, is Joseph there? No. Where is he? I don't know. He's maybe dead. Yeah. C- probably dead. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I honestly don't know. Yeah. I think uh, the last we hear about Joseph in the Bible is like when Jesus is uh, an adolescent, like he's eight or something. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and even so, when we talk about, you know, when, when Jesus is, re- when Joseph is referenced in the Bible, it's so often as like, you're the son of a carpenter and not the son of Joseph, the carpenter, you know, like, uh-huh. and, and I think it's a weird situation where, you know, Mary carried the the son of God and, and Joseph was just kind of a bystander and was only like the legal, the legal guardian of Jesus Christ until he rose. But like, yeah, Joseph's part in the story is, is unimportant. And, and he's literally forgotten um, in, in the story a lot. Now he's a saint now. I just want to make sure that the, the Catholic church has ordained him as, as a saint. So like, it's not like he got nothing out of the deal. Um, but yeah, I really, yeah. really interesting stuff, though. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting connection. Didn't think of that. Yeah, so that's Ralph Carver who dies via eagle. The maybe. eagle, which I, but I'm pretty sure I could have defeated an eagle in single combat. <laughs> so. Is this like the? They, I I read somewhere they did like a a poll amongst men of like, uh-huh. could you land a, an airplane? Yeah. <laughs> And like, Could like a vast a majority of men were like, yeah, I mean, probably. Yeah. I think, I think, I think Americans were like many times more likely to say that they, that they could fight a bear or that they could fight like <laughs> a, a tiger or a cougar or all these other animals. Um, but it was interesting. Like, I thought it was interesting because it's like, on the one hand, American men were, were grossly overconfident that they could fight a bear. Um, cause they, you, you couldn't, you would die. Mm-hmm. But, but also, um, a surprising number of people didn't think they could beat like a cat. And I'm like, you can beat a cat. cat? Yeah. A a house cat. It it was, yeah. Like literally a house cat. I'm like, they weigh like 12 pounds. Come on. Come on. You don't even need a weapon. You could just pick it up and throw it. Yeah. Yeah. Like what is it going to do to you? It's going to, I mean, (laughs) it'll scratch you up, but yeah, it'll hurt. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) You're not going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, I just, I just want, I I could probably land an airplane. That's all. Yeah. No, I, I think I think uh, the executive decision. You just gotta lower the flaps or raise I the think flaps, one or the other. Part of the question was if you had someone on the ground talking you through the process, because like the part of landing the airplane that I couldn't do is like all the switches and knobby things. But if I had someone telling me exactly where to put the switches and knobby things, I could probably land an airplane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which we're part of the problem. <laughs> We, you know, you, you, got, you got to have people who think they can land an airplane in, in yeah. your society. That's I know. Those are the people that are going to land the airplane. Yeah, exactly. Or die trying. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so David, of course, at uh, the reaction to Ralph's death is, is besides himself. This is when Johnny steps in and tells Steve to get David out. And uh, we get this part, Matt, which is it's really rough. Let go, he screamed. It's my job. Mine. No, David, Johnny said, holding on for dear life. It's not. He can't take them all and then not let me fin and then let me not finish. And then Johnny says, the the wonderful I love this so much, Matt. Listen to me, David. I'm going to tell you something you didn't learn from your minister or your Bible. For all I know, it's a message from God Himself. Are you listening? David only looked at him, saying nothing. You said God is cruel the way a person who's lived his whole life on Tahiti might say, Snow is cold. You knew but you didn't understand. He stepped closer to David and put his palms on the boy's cold cheeks. Do you know how cruel your God can be, David? How fantastically cruel? 
David waited, saying nothing, maybe listening, maybe not. Johnny couldn't tell. Sometimes he makes us live. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. It's everything. It's ev- It's this uh-huh. whole book right there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for all that I've complained about this moment or that moment not landing, this absolutely sealed it for me. And I was like, okay, good. This this thematic landing was perfectly stuck. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it sucks. <laughs> I hate oh, it. Oh, it, it totally but it, sucks. But yeah. It's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. So uh, he commands him to live. Uh, he tells him to go find his friend Brian and make him his brother and forget all about this thing. And then he has Steve send him away and he sends everyone away. Johnny sends them all away. And I think at this point, if you haven't figured it out already, Matt, you were like, oh, Johnny's Johnny's dying here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I think the combination of the tone and just the obvious d- narrative direction, I, I was like, okay, I guess I'll, I, I still honestly, I'm like, well, then why, what was all that shit about him having like a, this perfect memory? Like what was, you know, okay, fine, whatever, whatever, fine. I, that was a red herring, I guess. What What do you mean? I Like I, I thought there'd be a narrative purpose to him having this, this whole like perfect memory. Like I, I put that together with the idea of like, well, he's supposed to, he has a perfect memory. He remembers everything because he's going to need that as a oh, you know, I see. I see. prophet of David. Um, who who can go on to tell the story? I, I actually thought it was reasonably likely that that Johnny would be the only one to survive, which would be cruel in a different way. Where it's like, you you know, the 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 young people all die. The only one who survives is this old man who's who's you know even even he himself sees himself as being played out and and useless. And now he's the one who has to carry the message out into the world, despite the fact that he'd rather just curl up and die. Gotcha. Uh, I, I thought of that as being a sort of poetic, cruel ending course that's not what's happening but um no yeah no i understand i mean i i guess in retrospect like that see that that character trait of johnny's is really just a a, a a plot device to explain and describe the audrey situation you know yeah but yeah that's all it is i guess you're right yeah uh, so as Johnny walks down the tunnel, we get this, and I, I love this quote here, Matt. It says, the Cantaz spoke in tones of madness, which he recognized from his own past life, sweetly reasonable voices proposing unspeakable acts. Like, you know, that, that fits in perfectly with what, with what uh, David said about him. If he, if he denies this stuff, right. That like he'll see tack everywhere, um, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. the Cantaz are, are speaking to him in a language he recognizes, in a language he's experienced before, in a, in a life he's led. Like, he, he, he maybe wasn't picking up a, a stone statue that was forcing him to do these unspeakable things, but he was doing them. Um, and he was, he, was living, he was living according to them, just without the, the idol itself. Yeah, you could even say there's no need for there to be a supernatural kanta. It, it can just be you're, you're, you're just in the thrall of this evil intent and that is what it is to be um possessed by yeah. a, a kanta yeah i like it you know t- once again the the thing i said at the beginning is taking the concepts of god and tack and, and abstracting them a little bit and making them not less not specific you know entities within the world but but concepts and that yeah. i think that is what we're seeing here with johnny that like you know he he was living according to these concepts already yep so Johnny heads further in thinking about what the cops said about him learning more about Numa, Soma, and Sarks and how right he was uh, when he gets to the eye, uh, smoke begins to rise out of the innie in kind of this gnarly three-pronged, three-eye-hold suction tube thing <laughs> Yeah, that's going to go over his mouth and nose. Uh, what did you think of this payoff? Like there's been several beats of Johnny kind of asking the question, so how did – how did Tack get the first guy? And everyone was just like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the payoff of that. Using an ectoplasm um, scuba tank thing <laughs> regulator. Fortunately, Matt, Johnny still has the motorcycle helmet and he slams it down over his head at the last minute protecting him. Uh, it's it's a really cool moment, I think. It is a cool moment. And it's kind of fun because I, I don't think that I even thought about this in the moment. But the idea that he went on this motorcycle um uh, you know, uh, uh, artistic uh, uh, vagabond journey across the country um, for the express purpose that he'd have a motorcycle helmet with him at the yeah. last moment. Yep. If he had just taken a car, uh, he wouldn't have a motorcycle helmet. Yep. 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 It all comes together. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so Johnny goes into the hole, which turns out to basically be this like funnel uh, with quartz all over it. And mm. he slides down it, basically ripping him to pieces as he goes. Like, I think there's something metaphorical going on here, right? I'm not I'm not totally clear on it, but like his clothes get shredded and rip off. His body is shredded up and it like bleeding out and being destroyed. Like there's something going on here, right? Like his basically in, in his final moments, his sarks, his flesh is being destroyed so that his pneuma, his his soul can can flourish and realize its true potential. Like I I feel like I feel like that's right, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, I think I think you're right. You know, we spent so much time talking about Numa and Sarks and so forth that it, it feels right. You know, couple that with cruelty is refining, and it's like he's being put through even more horrible physical suffering and an almost you know crucifixion style, like just just piling on the suffering. Um, and and it, it allows his soul to transcend and, and become even stronger, you could say. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So Tack, in these last moments, tries to convince him to take the helmet off. He promises him everything, anything, uh, a Nobel Prize, a Pulitzer. Uh, but Johnny will not be deterred, Matt. But but why? Why is he not deterred in these moments? What What is it like? I guess it's the fundamental change that's happened to him, right? That these that the promises of everything that past Johnny would have leapt towards are fall upon deaf deaf ears now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he's not interested in these um, worldly temptations anymore. He he mm-hmm. understands what he actually wants, which is this spiritual redemption um, that he's about to get. Yeah, and uh, I think one other interesting thing is the other thing he promises him is is life. Like I'll heal you. I, I mm-hmm. like you are dying now. You have slid down this thing. Your body has been sliced up. You are slowly bleeding to death. And what I can do is I can save you. And this is this is deeply interesting coming from a Johnny who, you know, did not want to live anymore. You know, he he tried to take his own life, and even even though that was not successful, he did not. He was not alive for the rest of his life, but he kept living. And and now the the way Tack attacks him is through, you know, saying I can I can make you live, I can keep you alive, and, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I also also remembering how um, one element of of Johnny's character is that he was afraid of dying. Actually, I mean, his mm-hmm. his the the sort of um voice of his of his ex-wife was saying to him like um how long are you going to let your fear of death keep you from living yep and here he is completely surrendered his fear of death yep absolutely um so he pours the info down the small hole at the bottom of the tunnel filling it completely up and i i wanted to read this for the reference because i love it uh, he was cut in what felt like a billion places and already he could feel the grayness of blood loss crowding in on his mind it made him think of Connecticut again and the way the fogs came in after dark during the last weeks of March and the first weeks of April. The old timers called it Strawberry Spring. God knew why. Um, I, I don't know, but I do know that you got to go out and murder people in the fog. <laughs> Strawberry Spring. It's a short story. It's a short story. We read, we read it and we talked about it a long time ago. It was a long, long time ago. It was yep. a great story. Um. <laughs> And a fun throwaway reference here. Yep. All right, Matt. Now t- comes time to light the info. And, and what does he do? How does he light it? What is the plan? Well, he pulls the shotgun shell out of his pocket. The shotgun shell that David took from the floor back in the jail. I bet you just totally forgot about Chekhov's shotgun shell, didn't you, Matt? Not totally, actually. I, I remembered it well enough to be like, once he pulls it out, I was like, wait, I thought it was David who picked up the shotgun shell, not Johnny. I guess I was just an idiot. Oh, he just swiped it from, uh-huh. from David's pocket. That's, that's where, that's what happened. So, so I did, I didn't, I mean, I forgot about it in the sense that I hadn't thought about it in a while, but sure. Yeah. So he ignites the shell while screaming, God, forgive me. I hate critics in the chapter and Johnny Marinville ends. And of course, when King writes that, he's not talking about uh, you and me, right? No, he's talking about everyone else. But yeah, but all us. the all the other ones. Yeah, he would agree with everything that we say and think, as uh-huh. we've discussed before. Obviously, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that ends the climax. We move from here towards the epilogue, 
uh, which is titled Part 5, Highway 50 Excused Early. We catch up with the surviving members of our quartet as they frantically run and then drive away from the China pit, barely making it out as Johnny's bomb goes off and causes the entire thing to collapse back in on itself. As they head back into town, Matt, they see dead animals everywhere. It's like all of the animals taken over by Tack just just kind of fall over and die where they where they stood. Um, and David starts quoting the Bible, Matt. Once again, he quotes uh, Exodus 19 talking about um, Mount Sinai and how you cannot go up on the mount or touch the border of it or or if you do so, you will be put to death. And this is an interesting thing to quote here, Matt. Just the, the context of Exodus uh, for everyone, um, uh, the Israelites fled Egypt, fled and came to Mount Sinai and were told to wait there for three days. In three days, God was going to come to them. This is the story of the Ten Commandments, right? Moses comes, yada, yada. You know the story, right? Um, but the part here is when God instructs Moses to tell them all, like, you got to wait three days. If you don't wait three days, if you people go up on the mountain, you got to kill them. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> we can't don't go it's holy don't go there it's, and david's interpretation and the reason he's quoting this right now is he said is that he and his family showed up they touched the mountain and they were punished for it and they were killed um which is which is an interesting interpretation of this verse right yeah i mean that's not a typical interpretation to be sure right because especially because they weren't um warned you know yeah Nobody told them don't go to desperation. Yeah. Um, but I guess somehow that's how it is in life. So you you accidentally touch the mountain that you didn't know you were, weren't supposed to touch. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you didn't know. <laughs> well, I I think I don't know. I, I, I it, my interpretation of this, and maybe I'm completely off base here, was that like David is spiritually destroyed right now like Mm -hmm. he is has gone through this this horrible thing and he he's grasping for something and anything and he's just pulling in verses and just saying this verse means this and this is my interpretation is this is what happened and it doesn't make sense it it doesn't make sense to me with the exception of the fact that the the chapter of the book is called exodus and we're at the end of the book um this reference makes zero sense to me and maybe mm-hmm. I just haven't read Exodus in a while. I need to read the whole, the whole book and maybe, maybe I'll be like, Oh, I see why David leapt to this. But to me, it's just like, you're just pulling at straws here, David. You're just, you're, you're, you're pissed off. You're brokenhearted. You're destroyed. And you this is fuck God. And so I'm going to pick a passage in which God is just like, don't go here. I'll kill you. And, uh, we mm-hmm. must that must that must be it that must be it we must have crossed the threshold we were not supposed to yeah i mean i agree that there's not really any obvious spiritual wisdom here it's just yeah. kind of nihilistic um mm-hmm. i mean david's interpretation of it is yeah so the story ends where it began matt on highway 50 as our surviving members drive back to mary and peter's abandoned car mary wants to take her car and wants david to come with her I really love this idea of her wanting to drive in the car to like hold on to the smell of Peter for just a little bit longer, like that she could go in the, in the van with everyone else, but she just wants to hold on to the smell just a little bit longer. You know, once Mm -hmm. again, those, those mundane moments of grief that we get, I think are are really, really wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I I found myself wishing that Mary would just adopt David and that would be the, the nice kind of tied up in a bow ending of the book. And, and and it's not that, that necessarily doesn't happen, right? We don't we don't know one way or the other. We leave the story before any of that's resolved. But, True. Uh, yeah. So the group agrees on their story. They're they're all going to collectively say they never went up to the China Pit at all. They just got arrested, escaped, hid out in a theater, and then got the hell out of the Dodge when the storm stopped. And that's all they know. And uh, and that'll be good enough, right? You know, I think is it David that says the government will probably just cover this up, just like they did to the aliens <laughs> yeah I, I don't remember who says it actually i feel like i feel like steve and him would be on the same page there though yeah no definitely so david climbs into mary's car with her and they start on their way he, he's wondering in these moments how he could possibly go on i love this line the days and weeks and months ahead looked impossible to him and i think that's a very human way to feel right you, you've been through a horrible traumatic event and one of the first things is like 
how can I possibly go on? Like, how, like how, how I, 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 yeah. I don't, I don't know. Right. Yep. I, I agree. But then David goes digging into his pocket and finds not the shotgun shell that was there, but a blue card, the card actually that he had nailed to the Viet Cong lookout at the request of God at the beginning of the book. It's got a note on it from Johnny. Um, and that the question is, how did Johnny get this card? Where, where did it come from? We don't know. Uh, the wind. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, I it's love cool. this quote yeah. though. Something moved inside him. Some huge thing. His throat closed up and then opened to let out a long wailing cry that was only grief at the top. Love that language. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that it, it leads you to ask what else is in the cry other than grief. And it kind of leaves it up to us to think yeah. about and decide. Well, what do you think? What's, it, what's your interpretation? You know, I think there's got to be some anger in it mm -hmm. to think this was all, <laughs> this was all preordained, you know, and, and this is the proof of it, right? Like the, the card is the symbolic proof that like, this is what you bargained for, for your friend, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but maybe other things too, maybe, um, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe um, a little bit of love in there too. I maybe think. A, I was trying to, to pick a positive emotion that would make sense. I mean, I think Happiness. yeah, maybe a little bit of gratitude or, or something. Yeah. I, gratitude, I yeah. grace, yeah. Um, hope. Yeah. 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 I don't know. So the note from Johnny to David says, David, stay ahead of the mummy. One, first John four, eight, remember. And of course, first John chapter four, verse eight is God is love. Mm -hmm. And the book ends with, with Mary saying, is he David? Is he love? And David says, oh yes. He folded the pass along its crease. I guess he's sort of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of our book, Matt. Good God shit. is love. God is love. After God is cruel. God is cruel, but God is love. And there's a paradox and there's a contradiction. And what are you going to do with that? Well, that's life, luck. baby. That's life, baby. Struggle. Struggle with it. Yeah. Because, I mean, th this, is, this is the thing that I think King articulates so clearly here that is something I've struggled with my entire life, which is this idea of, you know, as you, as you said, like the, the, the eternal question of, why do good things happen to, or why do bad things happen to good people? Why, why does cruelty happen? Why does suffering happen? Like, why, why in this world is it so cruel? And, and furthermore, like, if God is everything, you know, if God is created all life, created all existence, rules over it, knows it all, then he has to be all the bad things too. You know, it's it's like in with Tolkien and and the song, right? When um, uh, uh what's his name? The bad, the bad guy. Uh, uh, Melkor. Melkor, Morgoth. thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like when when he attempted to change the song, that was always just part of the song, right? Like, yeah. It, it's the same idea here that like everything that happens is not not at the will of, but is part of God who created everything. And 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 again, to abstract it is part of life, is part of existence, is part of this 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 thing that we all go through and experience it's it's cruel it's hard but it's wonderful too it's it's you know like the the ways the, the, the every every moment of a person being cruel to another person can be countered by a moment of a person you know showing kindness to someone else saving someone else lifting someone else up it, it is all of it it is all of it and you know whether you attach that to you know to your own personal god or just you know, how, how you get through <laughs> the day to day of this whole existence. I think it is, it is equally profound to me. Um, if you just, if, 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 if the capital G God is what works for you, but if you sub that out for anything else, I think it, it becomes just as profound. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's a beautiful sentiment. Um, you know, I, I, feel in danger of repeating myself, but maybe people have forgotten about bliss orb by this point. But I mean, that, that, that is what I think about in, in this situation where it's like, um, well, if you really expected God to be sort of, um, 
a, a, a the the kind of father who coddles rather than, than than the kind of father who strengthens you know the kind of the kind of father who allows no evil to ever befall the child um then there's kind of no limit to that you end up where instead of really being a, a whole person who has experienced a variety of things in their life some of which are necessarily struggles uh you just end up with a sort of um featureless bliss orb entity and and that's just what we all are we're all just these bliss orbs that are totally blissed out and we never suffer but also we never really do anything because even just the simple act of getting out of bed in the morning is something that you only do because you're driven by all of these you know necessities if if you didn't do that you'd you would starve ultimately Mm -hmm. right so um yeah, I don't know. That's that's how I kind of square the circle. Not that I think about this much outside of the context of talking about books that are entirely <laughs> about the Odyssey. Sure, sure. I, I think I think that that's the difference between you and me, where I think about this stuff all the time, <laughs> all the time, and I and I struggle with it all the time. And I think that the thing I've gotten to in my in my elderly years is the answer to the question why do bad things happen to good people has to just be because it it does like th- th- there is there is no other answer than that it's like well, be- just because and that's not a satisfying answer right it's not but like what other answer could there possibly be it's just that that's what happens sometimes that's the existence it it is it yeah. is it is terrible awful things that sometimes are because of you know willful malice on behalf of of people but sometimes you know, a rock just falls off a cliff and hits you, you mm-hmm. know, like, like there's, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And, and, you know, you, you can, you can look back on it and attach purpose to it in the end, but ultimately all that matters is how we react to these seemingly random moments of our lives. Um, and, and, and what we, what we can take away from them, if anything. And I don't know, I, 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 I don't know how to square some of the stuff. I, I love that, King's novel makes us think about them, even though, uh, even though, like, I do think he offers an imperfect answer here, and and I think it's supposed to be imperfect. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it has to be right. I mean, if it were, if it were the final be all end all answer to this question, then um, this book would be a lot more popular. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it 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 recognizes the truth of the paradox, right? It is a sort of paradox. Yeah, I I yeah. I, I think I said like. God is love. God is everything. God is cruel. God, yes, all all of the above. That seems like a contradiction. You kind of have to grapple with that contradiction um, if you are at all interested in understanding, you know, the um, the problems at hand here, um, mm-hmm. or or finding meaning in existence. You could say, yeah, like I even agree. outside of a spiritual sort of explicitly theological context, I think you do somewhat have to str- struggle with these issues. Just to make any sense of the concept of meaning, yeah. right? Like even if it's human created meaning, like where, 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 where does that situate itself in this world? That's so full of um, horrible things. Like again, setting aside any, any theological like justification of, of like, well, it's, you know, God works in mysterious ways. It's like you, I, I, I actually agree with you. Like it is a, it is a, uh, a topic worthy of, meditation whether or not you are religious honestly yeah no i totally agree i mean it, the, the words you use for it are different and the things you turn to to read about and to study are different but ultimately it's all us asking asking the same questions and suffering from the same fears and and yeah. confusions of, of of what it means to be alive and and uh, yeah and, and and finding purpose and and what your purpose is and 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 so often like no no god like whether you believe in god or not he doesn't come down to you and tell you what your purpose is right like that that's not a thing that actually happens in real life and but but once again this book is using the conceit of genre to explore okay but what if he does and and let's let's use that idea to explore faith and meaning and purpose and love and cruelty and all these things yeah love it i do i like it a lot um and, and and again, like I'll repeat myself, but I, I like that the answer it gives is one that also makes you scratch your head and go, yeah, but like, 
but that was really mean what he did. <laughs> yeah. So I, I agree. God is love. I, I, I buy into that totally, but like, that was really mean those things he did. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think as a, as a final note, at least in this conversation, like I, I feel like it would have been dishonest to, to pull the punch here. Right. Because, yeah. Cause we know, like we, we all in our mind have a worst thing we've ever heard. And I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not going to say what mine is because I don't want to burden anyone with, with such a horrible thing. <laughs> the The point is we all have a story that we've heard, you know, hopefully not something that happened to us, but something we know about that's true. And we're like, that's the most fucking awful thing I've ever heard of. Mm-hmm. And you have to be able to, to put that in this context and be like, but okay, but that, that story though. Mm-hmm. That story, that's something that God allowed to happen. Mm-hmm. And in this case, King doesn't know everyone's private worst thing they've ever heard, but it, he he settles for, well, the young boy, his whole family dies. That's pretty pretty bad. That's super mm-hmm. bad. That's unequivocally one of the worst things that can happen to a person. Um, his whole family and, dies. A, a whole town dies cruelly. Yeah. Like, remember that that little baby? Like. Yeah. The, the 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 level of cruelty and unspeakable suffering that happened in the town of desperation is some of the worst in in King's long repertoire for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that that's what I mean is it would have felt really sort of it would have undercut its own message if in the end it's it's like you know Ralph gets to live or something like that. Yeah, it's like okay, but we know we know that the world is crueler than that. Meaning God is crueler than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Totally. Uh, we'll have, I think, many more things to say about this next week, but yep. uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and, and break to the discussion question now, yep. and we'll we'll circle back around to this conversation a few times next week, I'm sure. Sounds good. All right, Matt, what was our question for our uh, audience last week? Who is your favorite sucky character that we desperately want to see have a turnaround? From and, the very- Matt, uh-huh. you, at that time, you didn't know whether our know. sucky character was going to have a turnaround. I didn't know, and he did, and, and it was... It was almost everything I wanted it to be. <laughs> All right. Uh, Perry Jane says, oh, Fredo Corleone. Uh, he, 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 like Jack Torrance, unfailingly makes the worst decision he could in any given situation. He's thirsty for acceptance and resentful when he doesn't get it. Connie's the family princess. Michael's the brilliant businessman. And Sonny is James goddamn uh, can, con, can, con. Can, con. Um, I knew that. And and what is Fredo? He wears bad suits and makes bad deals in Vegas. But because of his gullibility and because of his clear position at the bottom of the Corleone family ladder, I want I really wanted I really I really wanted for him to take at least one good decision and win at the end. Instead, he decides to go fishing. He decides that going fishing would be a nice way to spend an afternoon. I know it was you, Fredo. I know it was you. You think Fredo knew it was going to happen to him on the boat? Um, I think a part of him did. I I think I always thought about that scene, and I'm like, he got he he's got to know because that, because it's like what like I'm just gonna get on the boat, I'm just gonna go fishing on this freshwater lake with this mob enforcer. Mm-hmm. And that's just how I'm gonna spend my afternoon. Yeah, no, we're just, just gonna, gonna have a nice, pleasant. We're gonna catch some fish. Yeah, it's gonna, it's be, gonna be awesome. And they both look like they're not having a great time. <laughs> I I always I always figured he knew honestly. I think he did, yeah. I think at that point in his his life, he's like so done. Yeah. Uh, next we have um like okay, who says my favorite sucky character that I desperately wanted to see have a turnaround is Jamie Lannister from Game of Thrones. Jamie begins the story as a hot pompous twin fucker who you can immediately slide into an asshole hotshot quarterback trope and safely categorize as belonging on your love to hate list, right? As the story progresses, Jamie loses his sword hand, learns some humility, and explains that he may have actually had some good reasons to kill the previous king and isn't just an opportunistic betrayer. We watch as Jamie grows disgusted by his nephew, son, and sister lover's evil behaviors, attempts to defeat evil forces for the good of the others, and treats a woman, Brienne of Tarth, with love and dignity. A beautiful redemption art in the making, right? Eh, kinda... In the end, Jamie circles back to his sister lover, making his character growth not necessarily meaningless, but at least marred by an ending that was unnecessarily bland at best, and in my opinion, jarringly out of line with the direction the character was headed. Although, maybe that's the point? Perhaps Jamie is a slave to Ka, which is always a wheel. 
um well i'm like okay luckily the second half of your answer didn't actually happen (laughs) but it did matt it did and the question we have to ask ourselves is is that the way george envisioned it i mean i i i I don't think anything past season eight is is the way george envisioned it with 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 jamie at least but so the the thing i'll say is um I could see George R. R. Martin writing into Lannister's arc that he does succumb to the the pull of his sister again. Like, I think he would execute it a trillion times better than the movie did, and 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 it would feel like a understandable earned character regression moment or something. Um, I could see it happening. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you emphasize the way where he sees himself as, as, you know, one half of a whole instead of emphasizing like, oh, but I love her. It's like, uh, it, it, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. I I feel like y- he could totally he could totally backslide in a way that felt um, correct for for his character. I agree yeah. with that much. Yeah, yeah. The the one thing for for sure is that the way the show did it uh, was not good. One of the many things that the end of that show just completely fumbled. Yep. Yep. So, and then, as I said, didn't happen. It was, it was <laughs> at another level of, um, King's Landing the, the, of, of Winterfell <laughs> and, another, and then another level of Winterfell. Doesn't even make any sense. It's another level of the tower of joy. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There it is. The most obscure game of Thrones reference imaginable. <laughs> No, actually, that's perfect. I'm a genius. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mark Mark Davo says, in answer to the discussion question, my answer is definitely Harold Louder. From the moment we meet him, we know he's a bit of a loser, but someone we can sympathize with. Then we go on that roller coaster of emotions as well uh, as well as realize he kind of sucks, sucks quite a lot, and is the suckiest person that ever lived. Uh, despite this, King puts that football in front of us and gives us a taste of, of what a non-sucky Herald, the Hawk, louder might look like. Then, like Charlie Brown, we end up with our butts. We end up on our butts when Harold's suckiness comes back in full force. Oh, Harold! Yeah, and and then after and then after that, it's the football is like replaced, but in a way that makes us feel kind of bad about it. Yeah, oh, I love that character so much, man. Yeah, me too. Uh, Steve Living Room says, my favorite pair of sucky characters that I hope would have a turnaround are Harold and Nadine. Both were so close to making the turn, but just couldn't let go of their hate. So sad and tragic. Yeah, I, I think I think you need to have some characters fail in this. Like, you can't have every character, you know, successfully, you know, um, succeed in, in, in having their turnaround. I think some mm-hmm. characters have to fail, and these are great examples of those characters that, that I genuinely wanted. I, I wanted... I wanted Hawk to get to live happily ever after. And, yeah. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't in store for him. Yeah. I mean, I think the the way Nadine is introduced as a character really makes you think she's going to be a good guy, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so it's really sad to watch her decline and fall. All right. Uh, Baby Can You Digger Sam says, interesting question. One answer would be Renton from Train Spotting. He's a dick in so many ways, but somehow he manages to be a likable dick and you root for him. Even when he's constantly screwing over his mates in one way or another, he never really grows up, never really is responsible or accountable to anyone, and he never really redeems himself. He just takes the money and runs. Um, another one is uh, Biff Griff Buford Tannen. <laughs> Has there ever been a more glorious asshole in cinema? Buford and all his male spawns seem to be afflicted with the g- generational douchebaggery and incapability to learn from past mistakes. Perhaps if Buford could have learned from his behaviors, we'd see a very different Biff. Maybe in returning to 1955-85 Hill Valley, George and Biff could have been BFFs. Alas, once a dick, always a dick. No amount of manure could redeem him. But they did try, though. They did try to redeem him with manure. I don't... (laughs) Several times. I don't... I love the Biff answer. I don't know if I ever wanted any of them to get better. I just loved hating them. Yeah, I think it's interesting how... In I I felt like in um in Back to the Future Biff is is a very cleanly straightforward antagonist, but then in Back to the Future Two 
he becomes like a f- far more three dimensional character, which kind of retroactively changes the way you think about the character <laughs> in Back to the Future One. Actually, um, I mean, perhaps only because like he's playing off of the future version of himself, who is much more antagonistic to him. Yeah, well, that, that, that's kind of what I mean. Is the future version of himself is a much cannier, subtler, smarter version of the character who's just mm-hmm. lived a lot more life um and and then it, it it you you just see the character as being a different a slightly different person based on that yeah and then there's of course the donald trump version of the character yes there is yes there is <laughs> um next we have don zesty who says going with my favorite wes anderson character royal tenenbaum total egomaniac who wants to be loved despite being bad husband and father eventually he becomes a little more self-aware and does the right thing resulting in an entire family being able to move on with their lives in a more positive direction the epitaph on the tombstone says it all died tragically rec- rescuing his family from the wreckage of a destroyed sinking battleship <laughs> i uh, love that movie me too i love that movie so much do you know there are people out there that don't like Wes Anderson? That's wild to me. It is wild. I mean, I feel like you if you're not exposed to it in the right period of your life, there's a chance that you just bounce off of it. I suppose. But um, I mean, this this is a brilliant movie, though. My favorite thing about Wes Anderson is his response to all the the critiques of his style um, are to do it more because uh-huh. every <laughs> every movie is just like, yeah, I'm gonna do this, but like more. Yeah. But but like never in a way that really feels like self parody to me because no, there's a risk no. when you're a creator who has a certain style. <laughs> Tim Burton, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, well, I don't know what happened there. Um, that weird. you that that you sort of fall into a rut of of absolute yeah. self parody. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and you just keep hiring Johnny J- J- Johnny Depp even though it doesn't make any sense. And um, <laughs> but but uh, Wes Anderson, I feel like. He 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 makes things weird and interesting and engaging in different ways. Like even even the uh, the Henry Sugar kind of short film on on YouTube, I was like, this is simultaneously so Wes Anderson and yet very very different in really interesting ways. Yeah, I really need you to watch Asteroid City. By the way, I know, I know, I know, I will. <laughs> All right, uh, Kashaku says. I would have to go with Walter White from Breaking Bad. At the beginning, you're kind of on board with his adventure into the illegal. He's just a regular guy who got dealt a bad hand as a result of his work. His intentions are just to get enough money to take care of his family after he dies. But as he gets deeper into the life and his actions become more extreme, I found myself hating him more and more. Yet, despite that, I wanted him to be able to walk away from it all and try to salvage whatever was left of the of who he was before this all started. I think this is a great answer. Yeah. Um, I I love this so much. Um, I think if you haven't watched the Breaking Bad pilot recently, mm-hmm. I would suggest going and and spending some time with that because mm-hmm. I I do think one thing Vince Gilligan is doing in this pilot and it's actually really brilliant is making you feel really 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 bad for this guy, yeah. like really bad for him. Like he's turning fifty, um, he gets cancer, and then like like his wife gives him a birthday hand job. Uh-huh. But it's while she's on the computer bidding on shit on eBay. Uh-huh. It's like the most depressing, <laughs> saddest thing I've ever seen. Uh-huh. And like, I, I think this is this is really smart because like we spend a lot of the first episode and and arguably a lot of the first season like really making you feel for this guy and and pitying him and and that allows you to be on his side and want to see him succeed and and in these early moments of him, you know, stay like taking his power and like do, you're like yeah fuck yeah and then over time you start to go eh. right. <laughs> and then and then the 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 uh, the core part of the character is kind of slowly revealed under that and it's still coming in conflict with your your intense desire to identify with him and like him and i, I, I just it's it's i mean everyone knows this but just absolutely brilliant series yeah yeah, I mean, there's there are a lot of wonderful moments where he really sort of heroically stands by Jesse, which makes it harder to notice later when he's when you kind of retroactively are like, wait a minute, was that actually bad? <laughs> <laughs> was this was this bad the whole yeah. time? Yeah, it's a great yeah. show. Yeah, it's. Uh, did you know uh, Better Call Saul, the the sequel, prequel, whatever to Breaking Bad? Great show, by the way. I still mm-hmm. haven't seen all the episodes. I need to finish it, but great show. 
uh, has the dubious distinction of being the most nominated show at the Emmys without ever winning. Oh, wow. No, it was not. nominated 53 times and it won zero Emmys. That's insane. Zero. That's yeah. ridiculous. That's an yeah. incredible number. <laughs> so sad. Yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on, we have uh, DJ N- N- Nadelko. Is that right? Sure. I think so. I just finished reading For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. First of all, what a great novel. I don't normally read historical fiction, and so I had to look up some things about the Spanish Civil War to give myself a background. I had a little trouble parsing out what the characters were saying initially, since they were slang Spanish phrases, which I didn't pick up on. But once I figured out what some of the Spanish sayings were, it began to make more sense. Anyway, the lead character, the character of Pablo fits this discussion answer really well. At one time, he was a headstrong leader of anti-fascist guerrillas, but for most of the story, he's reduced to a pessimistic drunk who does nothing to assist the mission the novel centers around he is present throughout the entire story and while it seems like he has every given ability to do anything he lacks the willingness to be useful and he thinks their position in the war is a lost cause i won't spoil the novel but my feelings toward pablo rose and mostly fell throughout the book and i really wanted some big redemption arc for him would he get it in the end you'll have to read it to find out i appreciate you not just spoiling this for us because i i have not read this book and it's it's a terrible, you know, travesty that I haven't. So we should put this on the book club poll at least. We should. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to like how much Hemingway have I read? Actually, not enough. I've read very little. I've read the Old Man in the Sea. I I'd have really also read the Old Man in the Sea. Can't I've read a farewell to arms. I've read the one where the guy goes fishing, which I don't remember what that's called. It's not the Old Man in the Sea. It's a different one. Um, isn't that? That's not The Sun Also Rises, is it? I don't think so. I've read uh, Cortland's Dogs. read that one. Okay. I think you read more than me. No, that that was that was a made-up one from from Stephen King's short story. Um, oh, yeah. No, no. I remember. Yeah, okay. okay. Just fucking with you. You got me. You got yeah, me. Got you. <laughs> All right. Um, J- uh, B. Johnson. B. Sorry. B. C. Johnson. Not B. Johnson. That's a totally different person says jay gatsby is a good contender i think whether he's the villain is up for debate personally i don't think so but he's certainly implied to have done something some shady shit with dubious characters to get his fortune rum running and prohibition skirting mostly which while moral while morally isn't that bad almost certainly came with collateral damage his naivete and obsession with the past causes plenty of harm too which he often runs away from hides or denies but there's a heroic streak to his character and a romantic hopefulness that makes you like the guy quite a bit. As a reader, I wanted him to be better. In the end, he realizes how much harm he's done and and says he's going to take the rap for everything that happened. He's never given the chance due to a misunderstanding by a grieving husband. Was Jay really going to throw himself to the lions? I think he was, but we'll never know. What do you think? Do you think he was? I think, yeah, I, I I think so. I mean, based on the book, I, I feel like this is easy to get contaminated with different adaptations, but I feel sure. like, I feel like he is just sort of this romantic and that's really the core of who he is. And, and I think like, you know, uh, uh, sort of demonstrating your, your, uh, qualities by romantically turning yourself in for a crime is, is exactly the kind of thing that a romantic would do. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. I agree. It's a good book. Yeah. I feel like it's it's like became so popular that people like kind of casually dismiss it, but I think it's a really good novel. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I th- this it sounds kind of shitty to say it this way, but like it's sort of wasted on high schoolers who are just sort of not prepared with the life experience to like get much out of it. Yeah, that's fair. And, and so I I should probably re- re- read it, reread it as a as an adult, honestly. Yeah, um, let's put that on the book club, too. Let's do it. Yeah, sure, sure. (laughs) Uh, Last but not least, we have Nick Vicious, who says, my pick is BoJack Horseman. No matter how many times he fucks up, and he fucks up a lot. Something in me kept thinking he's going to change this time. BoJack is a character who can't accept responsibility, though. When something goes wrong in his life, it's because of the things that happened in his past or some other excuse. But as his roommate friends tell him, you are all the things that are wrong with you. It's not the alcohol or the drugs or any of the shitty things that happened in your career or when you were a kid. It's you, all right? It's you. Fuck, man. What else is there to say? I don't know why I kept rooting for that horse, man. But man, it does hurt every time he proved me wrong. Spoiler warning here, but I love the finale as it 
doesn't give, really give a clear answer on whether or not Bojack will change. As going through so much with these characters and really coming to love all of them, I would have been so mad if they gave Bojack a happily ever after. Life doesn't always work that way, and I think Bojack already got more than enough free passes already. You've never seen the series, right, Matt? Never seen the series. Uh, it's wonderful. I I loved it so much, and and I agree with you, Nick Vicious. I think that's the like. This is kind of what we were doing with the Bojack character is that like you're kind of along for the ride with him with a lot of it. And he's very funny. Um, and so you like and you want to see him like you both want to see him get what's coming to him and want to see him succeed at the same time. And you want him to change. It's it's all very <laughs> confusing and, and wonderful. And it's it's a great show. Everyone should watch it. It's on Netflix. Cool. Yeah, I am. Um, I get it. It sounds fun. It sounds it sounds infuriating. Is the truth? Um, <laughs> like I feel like I would, I would. This would be a character who I would like hate, but then I would watch the next episode because I yep. I had to know, you know, one hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, but that is that is it. Um, that's all the answers, right? Yep. 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 That's it. We did it. We did it. All right. So that is it. Uh, next week we are going to be doing our desperation overview episode, and of course, what comes along with that, Matt, but another mailbag love the mailbags we are going to be answering all of your questions you can ask us questions about desperation about stephen king in general or just about whatever you want um we will try to answer as much as we can sometimes those episodes go on way longer than we want them to but uh i think the only thing i'm going to say is is you cannot ask questions about uh the regulators just yet because we're still reading that we're reading it right now um and we're going to be talking about that in just a few weeks after we finish up with the the desperation movie. Um, so just don't ask any questions about that yet. Yeah, that's right. And uh, remember, you can reach out to us with those answers or questions rather um, to the email address kingslingerspod at gmail.com or over on Twitter at kingslingerspod. And of course, I think probably the best place to do it is over on the subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash doof media. Um, that is the place to go to hang out and chat with fellow uh kingslinger heads that that's what they're called always have been <laughs> please please come up with something else yeah y- kingslinger y'all, heads y- y- y'all come up with something else because i don't think there is a word for this but there should be there should be <laughs> okay I'll, I'll let them come up with some stuff yeah <laughs> let's not do kingslinger heads <laughs> god i hope that doesn't become a thing <laughs> Well, now that you've said that, it's definitely going to become oh, a thing. Oh shit, shit. Um, hey, Kingslinger heads, while you're <laughs> while you're at it, why don't you head on over to our merch store, uh, which is open right now and has tons of uh, Kingslinger merch, Doof Media merch, all the stuff. We got shirts, we got hoodies. Let me tell you something. It's been really cold in Texas this past week. Like, and I'm not exaggerating. Like, like teens and tens and stuff like that single digit temperatures at times uh-huh. the freaking uh hoodie that we sell yeah i have one uh-huh it's a warm hoodie man yeah it's 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 a pretty thick hoodie yeah. it's good shit my house has been so cold lately and this hoodie is saving me yeah a good hoodie's worth its weight in gold is what i always say i don't think i've ever heard you say that uh, you just don't pay very good attention i guess i guess not uh <laughs> So yeah, check out uh, doofmedia.myshopify.com for your excellent, incredibly warm hoodie and a bunch of other merch. There's a lot of really cool stuff in there. Um, I can attest to it personally because I ordered a whole bunch of it. And I just ordered like six more mugs today. Nice. So I don't know what I'm going to do with all these mugs, yeah. but I just like them all. Yeah, yeah, I know you're short on mugs in your household. I have so many mugs. I just I one day I'll I'll send you a picture of my mug cabinet, which is an entire cabinet filled with mugs. Please do. Uh, if you are not already subscribed to Kingslingers, oh boy, you you got to because we're finishing up Desperation and the Regulators. Then we're moving on to the 2000s with a, a book I'm very excited about called Duma Key. So uh, it's a great time to to hop on board if you just found this one random episode and we're listening to it. Uh, please subscribe. I am also excited about Duma Key. Um. If you like Kingslingers and you want to support us, then please consider donating to our Patreon on patreon.com slash doofmedia. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of different tiers with different rewards, but I think the one that you you are probably most interested in would be the one where we talk about Castle Rock, the TV show inspired by the works of Stephen King. Been really enjoying it so far, and we had a really good conversation about that last couple weeks ago. And <laughs> we're going to have another really great conversation in a couple more weeks, so yep, go check yep. that out. Matt has already watched the next two episodes. He's he's in ahead of me, so I've got to catch up and watch some TV this weekend, and uh, and then we'll talk about it some more. All right. Um, if you cannot afford to provide us uh, with your hard-earned money, that is absolutely okay. You can still help us out by sharing the podcast, and as always, you can help us out by leaving those wonderful reviews. This week's review comes from John W., who left us a review on Audible. He gives us 15 whole stars and says, the best podcast about Stephen King. That's a... Uh, let me just say this. like Our peers in this space are incredibly talented, wonderful people, right? Uh-huh. So, like that... This is is a very, very kind thing for John to say. It is, it is. Um, John says, found these guys right after my first run to the tower in the thick of COVID. They make my daily commute so much better. Their other stuff is great too. Doof Media has not forgotten the face of their father. Thank you. That's very kind. That's very kind. That's beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, folks. We'll see you right back here next week as we talk about desperation for one last time. We'll see you then. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. 